production of the inquiry was presented by me, Charmaine Cozier. The producer was Jill Collins, researcher Matt Tolson, editor Tara McDermott, and technical producer Cameron. That was the BBC's The Inquiry. I'm Jeff Goods here on CBC Radio 1. Have a great day. Good morning, Manitoba, and hello, Winnipeg. Well, we are in quite a studio this morning. I feel like I'm in a log cabin. We're in the community of St. Laurent, Manitoba, some uh, 70 kilometers northwest of Winnipeg on the east shore of Lake Manitoba. And we are here because it's one of our communities in focus for CBC Manitoba. We have reporters and producers here all week sharing the story of this vibrant community that survived a uh, drastic flood in 2011 that celebrates rich Métis history and that has so many stories to share. We'll get some of those stories on the show this morning. I am Marcy Marcusa with our team here. Corey Funk is on location with me. Uh, Dylan Longhurst and Abby Adiemi and Brad Lilly's back uh, in Winnipeg. And thanks for tuning in to CBC. 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app uh, or online. Well, in uh, Winnipeg, uh, it is uh, foggy, going to be foggy. A fog advisory has been issued. Driving up here yesterday, I'll tell you, you couldn't see nary a thing. And it's going to be the same condition here. Icy out in St. Laurent this morning. Back in Winnipeg, the uh, current con- temperature is I believe we're at minus four right now with some mist. And let's uh, start our day, even though we're here with our headlines for all over Manitoba with Heather Wells. Good morning. Well, the interim leader of Manitoba's Conservative Party believes parents should be informed if their child wants to change their pronouns. Wayne Iwasku wants to ensure parents are involved. He says the vast majority of the time, school staff can help students communicate with their parents and alleviate fears about how their parents will react. Manitobans from Haiti are concerned for their family as their families as the country is embroiled in crisis. Armed gangs, as we've been telling you all week, have taken over the capital, Port-au-Prince. Marie Pudwell moved from Haiti to Winnipeg in 2008. She says her family back home is living in constant fear. We'll hear from her coming up in our next local news at 6:30. All right, thank you, Heather. You're welcome. So as I mentioned uh, here in Winnipeg, in, uh, pardon me, in Winnipeg, I'm used to saying here in Winnipeg, uh, in Winnipeg, uh, it is misty minus four. The high in the city is going to be three to three degrees. Today in St. Laurent, you're expecting two degrees, ice pellets this morning, and a possible showers this afternoon. Uh, the log cabin I described is in fact the restaurant that's in the back of MTT Petro Canada off of Highway 6. That's where we're broadcasting from this morning. So stay tuned. We'll have much more ahead. We'll tell you about the stories that we're going to be covering. But first, we need to go to national and international. International News on 89.3 World Report is coming up next. Hey, on Q with Tom Power. Diana Lee Inosanto grew up in a unique household. Her dad was a legendary martial arts trainer. Her godfather was Bruce Lee. Diana will talk about getting her big break as an actor in her 50s. I have the gift of gratitude on such a profound level. And what you might not know about being a stuntman. That's coming up on Q, followed by Commotion with El Amin Abdel Mahmoud on CBC Radio 1, CBC Listen app, and everywhere you get your podcast. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. Officials across Canada are preparing for another extreme wildfire season. How it all plays out depends on what kind of weather we get in the next few weeks. Scientists are also poring over the data from last summer. It was the worst wildfire season on record. And as Ben Shingler reports, experts are looking for lessons to get ready for another tinder dry summer. Record breaking is almost a euphemism. Marc Parisien has spent the past few months taking stock of the 2023 wildfire season. He's a research scientist at Natural Resources Canada and one of the authors of a new study. A lot of what happened last year challenged what we thought we understood about wildland fire. There weren't more fires compared to other years, but the average size was far larger. Roughly 15 million hectares burned across Canada, more than seven times the average. The study says early snowmelt and drought conditions in western Canada and sudden dry weather in the east are to blame. Warmer, drier conditions are leading to Uh, Much bigger fires, more intense fires. Katrina Moser is an associate professor in geography and environment at Western University. She says much of Canada is already on alert for this season. We are unfortunately seeing very similar conditions uh, coming into the spring. So very warm uh, temperatures again. 
uh, low snow cover uh, again right across Canada. Quebec issued a warning for parts of the province last week. And in Alberta, B.C. and the Northwest Territories, some fires from last year were never fully extinguished. Experts say whether Canada is in store for another big wildfire season depends on the weather in the weeks to come. But as the climate changes, the country will need to be ready for more in the years ahead. Ben Shingler, CBC News, Montreal. Lithuania's president has a message for Vladimir Putin. No one is afraid of you here. These comments come as a police investigation in Lithuania begins into an attack on one of Alexei Navalny's close colleagues, Leonid Volkov, was a longtime aide to the deceased Russian opposition leader. Volkov was reportedly sprayed with tear gas and hit with a hammer yesterday in Vilnius. He survived. And just hours before the attack, he gave an interview where he spoke about the dangers of opposing Russia's president. Our work is full of very complicated challenges, of enormous pressure, of high individual risks. Because we know that Putin does not only kill people inside Russia, he also kills people outside Russia. Volkov has been released from hospital. In a video posted online, he promises he will never give up on his work. Joe Biden will once again face Donald Trump in the upcoming U.S. presidential election. Each candidate secured enough delegates to become their party's nominee in yesterday's primaries. The CBC's Richard Madden joins me now from Washington. And Richard, no surprises again last night. But break down what this all means as we head towards the November vote. Yeah, it's like the start of a movie sequel. Everyone knows the plot, the main characters, but we just don't know how it ends yet. With their nominations clinched, polling suggests it will be another tight race between Joe Biden and Donald Trump that will once again come down to key swing states. Now, last night, both candidates released videos after their win, hoping to shape the ballot box issue. So for 81-year-old Joe Biden, it's a story about an American comeback post-pandemic, but he warned what's at stake if voters choose the alternative. Are you ready to defend democracy? Are you ready to protect our freedom? Are you ready to win this election? Now, Donald Trump's video slammed Biden's handling of the economy, and he promised a sweeping immigration crackdown with record deportations. Now we have to get back to work because we have the worst president in the history of our country. His name is Joe Biden. Now, both nominations will be made official at party conventions this summer, giving Americans their first presidential rematch in 70 years. There are still individual candidates in this presidential race. What can you tell us about them and how they could affect the vote? Yeah, that could be a factor, especially with two candidates who are generally unpopular with voters looking for an alternative. You've got the Green Party, no labels, Robert Kennedy Jr., and other independents fighting for a spot on the ballot. Now, a third party could tip the scales, especially in those key swing states where the margins of victory have been so slim. Think Al Gore in 2000, Hillary Clinton in 2016. Now, the chances of a third party winning an election is very slim, but if a candidate swings enough states in key states from either Biden or Trump, they could ultimately decide who won the election. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. The CBC's Richard Madden in Washington. There is a rush for power happening right now in Haiti. Politicians are vying for a place on the transitional council that will replace Prime Minister Ariel Henry. But the gangs that forced him out are also demanding a seat at the table. At the same time, the capital is facing lawlessness, violence and dwindling health care. Etienne Côté-Paluc is editor-in-chief of Haiti Weekly. We've reached him in Port-au-Prince. Etienne, what is the situation on the ground this morning? This morning, the situation is pretty calm. We had a curfew again last night, but still everybody's really waiting to see what will be the reaction from the the violent uh, criminal groups that took over the streets for the last 10 days. Right now, the situation is pretty difficult for everybody because we're all in our houses waiting to see how it's going to happen, trying not to take the street too much. All the schools are closed. The good news is that yesterday, they announced that the commercial port was reopened. The commercial port was closed by the the gangs themselves last week and we thought that might stay like that for a while now we see that it's coming back in function and there was some gas in gas stations so for now uh, we're taking the good news where it is 
What have you heard about the process to bring in a governing council to replace Ariel Henry? There's big political discussion happening right now for the last few days about that uh, presidential commission. Uh, some people are, are for it, some people are against, but now we're, the, the political discussion is around who's going to be part of it. Uh, it's a coalition of seven people from different political parties and associations. They have to not have been arrested already or have any accusations against them. So it's two big criteria that would take them out from the start out of the negotiation. And that's why some of them are calling for protest today. But we're not expecting big protests because of the situation. Thank you, Etienne. My pleasure. Etienne Côté-Paluc with Haiti Weekly in Port-au-Prince. Four U.S. Army vessels are now en route to the eastern Mediterranean. They are carrying about 100 soldiers who will build a temporary port on Gaza's coast. It's all designed to help more aid get into the Palestinian territory. Here's U.S. Army Brigadier General Brad Hinson. Once we get uh, fully mission capable, we will be able to push up to uh, 2 million meals or 2 million bottles of water ashore each day. The U.N. says it has been difficult to get food and supplies into the northern part of the Gaza Strip. Hinson says the offshore platform and pier should be up and running in 60 days. Italy's new right-wing government is planning to pass a new law and order bill. It would usher in an unprecedented crackdown on prisoners. As Megan Williams tells us, the proposed law comes at a time when prisoner suicides in Italy are at an all-time high. A gate shuts close in Milan's main San Vittore prison, a rundown penitentiary built 150 years ago. That is Italy's most crowded, holding two and a half times the number of prisoners it was designed for. Due, due to overcrowding and worsening conditions, the rate of self-harm and suicide here and in other prisons is soaring, say experts. And they say a proposed new law by Italy's government, headed by the far right Giorgia Meloni, would make things worse. This is an erosion of the rule of law and a constitutional setback, says prisoner rights advocate Patrizio Gonella. In the new law, prisoners who beat on their cell bars or refuse to work or eat could be punished. Legal experts and prison workers say the law would exacerbate the growing problems of overcrowding and understaffing and make it harder for inmates to access health, psychiatric and educational services. Criminal lawyer Valentina Alberta says the proposed law is the most severe in Europe where overcrowding is also rife. That nothing like that is uh, in other countries and I don't think that uh, the European Court of Human Rights is going to accept a bill like that. Since coming to power in late 2022, Maloney's government has cracked down on everyone from rave organizers and climate protesters to parents who let their kids skip school. Megan Williams, CBC News, Rome. And that is the latest national and international news from World Report News Anytime at cbcnews.ca. I'm Marcia Young. Hi, I'm Brandy. I work here at MTT on Highway 6, and you're listening to Information Radio live from St. Laurent. Woohoo! Woohoo, indeed. We're so pleased to be here at uh, Communities in Focus. We're actually here in this community all week long. This morning, though, our show is live from MTD Diner just off Highway 6, as Brandy said. Thank you to the community for welcoming CBC Manitoba as we shine a spotlight on the stories from this part of our province. It's icy in this part of our province this morning. It was foggy yesterday. It's going to be foggy again today with an advisory that also includes Winnipeg. Good morning. I'm Marcy Marcusa. We're on location with our team on 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or online. And thank you for joining us. This hour on our special broadcast, what a spot to have a studio dedicated to expressive arts therapy. A studio that looks out over Lake Manitoba, which is just up the roadway from where we're sitting this morning. We're going to start by learning more about a place called the Wheat Institute. They're having an open house, in fact, here in St. Laurent tonight. So stay tuned for that. In addition, a little later, we have our medical column today. Dr. Bardwaj talking about spring cleaning medical-wise. What does your cabinet look like at home? Are all those medications up to date? What if you're traveling? So stay tuned. Uh, Raj Bardwaj will be on with us this hour as well. Uh, right now, it's 6.11 a.m. Let's say good morning to Heather Wells, who's here with other headlines. Hi there. Hi there. 
Well, the person in charge of Manitoba High School sports hopes justice can be found for the victim or victims of an alleged incident of hazing in hockey. The RCMP and two school divisions are investigating the Prairie Mountain Mustangs. That team draws players from several rural high schools. We'll hear from Chad Falk at the Manitoba High School's Athletics Association coming up. And a Winnipeg doctor is suing after she was injured when a parkade elevator near the health sciences center suddenly dropped while she was inside we're going to hear what happened uh, and it, it was something that happened a couple of years ago and uh, the woman who was inside who is suing now has permanent disabilities so we'll hear that story as well coming up in our next local news at 6 30 heather walls yes Abby's about to talk about the fog advisory this morning. Uh, I can tell you that yesterday there were moments where I was looking in front of myself on the highway and then I would look in my rearview mirror and it was like I was in a pocket of white, like in the middle of some uh, pillow fluff or something. Uh, it is going to be serious stuff this morning, I think. It really will be. And when I drove in too, it was like that uh, through parts of southeast Winnipeg. Once it got downtown, it improved. But if you're uh, in the open areas, uh, near zero visibility expected. Yeah, so Abby's here to uh, tell us about the rest of the forecast. Good morning, Abby. Good morning, Marcy. Yes, near zero visibility. You know, driving in from the south this morning, just as Ada mentioned, it felt like a scene from one of those uh, pirate movies and you don't know what's ahead. I just had to, like, take it easy, maintain a safe distance. Right now, we're waking up to minus 3 in the city with cloudy skies overhead. We will be seeing light winds, though, and expecting to reach a high of 3 degrees today. And we should expect mainly cloudy conditions with the chance of uh, some freezing drizzle this morning. Now, a dense fog advisory is in effect for southern Manitoba and uh, various uh, regions across the province, which includes uh, the city of Winnipeg, the Red River and Pemina Valleys, the Interlake and Eastern Manitoba, the White Shell. Uh, these affected areas will be experiencing near zero visibility due to the thick fog, and this can make travel really, really uh, tricky. So I'd advise you if you're on the road this morning, take caution. Um, just take it easy. Remember to slow down. Keep an eye out for other vehicles and be prepared to stop if visibility decreases because if you're going around those bends like on the highways or open areas, it might be challenging. So uh, be prepared to stop uh, if visibility is uh, hampered. Just expect the fog to be lifted around midday today. Once again, Winnipeg, we are at minus three degrees. All right, thank you, Abby. So I just want to take a moment here to talk about where we are. So you've heard me reference the lake, but if you don't know this part of Manitoba, you've also heard me reference Highway 6. We are close to Winnipeg. We are really only about an hour northwest of Winnipeg. But St. Laurent is uh, on the, and you're going to hear me say St. Laurent and St. Laurent all morning. Don't call the listener line. People here pronounce it both ways. <laughs> but uh, we are really adjacent to Lake Manitoba. Literally, it's up the roadway. It was so foggy yesterday, you couldn't even see the lake. Uh, but it is here. And a lot of people come here for the lake the community that lives here year round is about 1500 people in the summertime that swells to uh probably around 4,000, from what i understand we'll have the reeve on in the next hour of the show and this is a proud metis community uh, one of the largest metis populations in all of north america in fact so we're going to learn a lot about the history of the place this morning and also about the present day challenges and uh, what is uh, ahead for this community as we meet some of the beautiful people that live here starting with my first guest a lot of people say that living near a body of water like Lake Manitoba uh, is very therapeutic. And my next guest says, when an opportunity came up for her to buy a property here for the Wheat Institute, she knew it was meant to be. Wheat stands for Winnipeg Holistic Expressive Arts Therapy Institute. It's a school that trains people to help others reconnect to themselves no matter what they've experienced in life, including trauma. It is celebrating 10 years this spring, and there's actually an open house here tonight for per prospective students. Darcy Adam is founder and director of the Wheat Institute and gets the award for the first guest of the day. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. It's great to be here. Thanks Thank for you. inviting me. Thank you for coming, especially on a foggy morning like this. <laughs> I'm a great fan of CBC Radio, so I'm really happy to be here. Oh, thank you very much for saying. So can you describe your space that's down by the water, the home that you bought here, and in particular, your, your painted sky studio? 
Sure. Painted Sky Studio is a two-story home that's on the lake and has a beautiful panoramic view of the lake. So I have 31 windows. I know that because I replaced them all. <laughs> so they look out onto the gorgeous Lake Manitoba. And we have just, there's a beautiful sunset view. Uh, even in the sunrise, which is coming from the opposite direction, the whole lake lights up. So it's just, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous community. And you were sharing with me that it's also a, a migratory route for birds. Yeah, in the spring, so in around May, early May, the birds come through and it's actually noisy on the lake because there's so many different varieties of birds. I have a friend who's a bird watcher and she's counted about 58 different types of birds. So... You know, I can look out my window and see a beautiful great horned owl just kind of 10 feet away from me. We see bald eagles all the time, uh, great blue heron down in the water. What a setting for the work you do in particular. Now, just so uh, listeners can understand, uh, they might be thinking arts therapy is all about painting. It could be. But this is expressive arts therapy. So can you share more about what that is? Sure. We actually do do both. So art therapy would be the use of visual arts. So that could be sculpture, plasticine, Play-Doh, painting, um, photography. So really any kind of art. And expressive arts integrates poetry, movement, uh, drama, really spoken word, all of the arts. So you could use any of the arts and it's they're combined for a greater impact. Uh, you have a background as a teacher. I know you've also done this kind of work or therapeutic work in your, in your past. You shared with me with various people, including uh, women who have uh, been exploited and such. Why do you think that this kind of therapy can connect with people? Yeah. I mean, we refer to art as the third. So you would build a therapeutic relationship with the client. So you're building a safe and caring relationship with the person who's coming for help. And then the art comes in. And just like when we go to an art gallery or experience a performance of some kind, art has a magical way of bringing in something that was not there previously. So the therapeutic art process is about creating. So you're actually doing something. You feel a sense of agency. And there's also a sense of calm as you really sink into the moment of creating creating something it's interesting because you were saying to me uh, you quote it's a, a quote that's that's a, a known quote but that the body keeps the score mm-hmm. so if you can't find words you know your body may still be holding some traumas and and even if you can't find words through you know sitting down in a therapy session expressive arts gives you all these different ways mm-hmm. to sort of work through that yeah and it's more integrated and more holistic so you, it's unlike talk therapy where it's more from a cognitive lens you're actually using your body and using your imagination. I love that we're sitting by art this morning in MTT. We're actually surrounded. We're going to show some pictures later. So the artist is uh, Meg Hanscock, and her work is on display all around us on the walls here. Mm -hmm. And I immediately uh, feel like I'm immersed in whatever she was creating with her calm. Mm -hmm. And the stories. So art tells a story, and it helps to kind of clarify and sometimes magnify the essence. I don't want to run out of time to talk about what's on the table, but I do want to ask you, how is being located in St. Laurent an asset when you think about uh, the land uh, that you're on here and the work that you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny because wheat has always been located by a water body. So we began at St. Norbert Art Center on the LaSalle River. And when I got the property in Saint Laurent, someone said, oh, you're really recreating that sense of of the art center by being near a body of water, having the opportunity to be outside on the land, and recognizing that as we're healing ourselves, we're deeply connected to our environment. So having that relationship with the environment and and understanding the importance of the wellness of the environment is really a part of healing from my perspective. And it's that uh, you do things also through an indigenous lens in your learning as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we did. We were involved in co-creating the first indigenized art therapy program in 2020. And we do still we have a strong uh, core faculty of indigenous supervisors and teachers. Um, we do a, a retreat at Ganiasic Culture Camp, which is a Cree culture camp in northern Saskatchewan. And so we learn more about Indigenous worldview and teachings. And we also have compulsory Cree language. So I know tonight you have an open house. If people are interested, and they can also go to your website for more information. And I'll ask you about that right before you go. But in the next 
couple minutes, we have to talk about what's on the table. So this is an example of a project that one of your students did and created it actually as a fundraiser uh, for you to, uh, to sell. But it's amazing because what we're looking at, radio listeners, is a box full of figurines uh, and there are, I think there's some, maybe 25 in each. And in each little uh, pouch, when you open up the box, there's little felt pouches and when you open them, it's like there's little ceramic figurines. Where did all these come from? So those are sets of Red Rose Tea figurines and the project was developed by Janine Tuga, who's a well-known creator in Winnipeg and author in the Francophone community and she was one of our students and as a project, she took the Red Rose Tea sets so there are 24 um fairy tale figurines and she created cards to go along with the fairy tales as well as games that therapists can use in helping people to tell their stories and then she also developed one in collaboration with an in indigenous culture keeper and it is called animal teaching circle of life so it it uses the animal figurines so again 24 animal figurines this is amazing and when you open them you feel like i'm feeling all these emotions so i'm feeling first of all the tactileness of the pouches and then the excitement and surprise as you open up the little red rose things and i'm feeling nostalgia because people would have had their grandmas and, and maybe moms would have would have collected these mm. um i love the little animals in that set there's a wolf i'm looking at a little gingerbread person in here just fabulous how many did she have I mean this collection must have yeah. been extensive she literally donated hundreds of these boxes for us as a fundraiser for our scholarship for indigenous students wow. so yeah a beautiful amazing contribution and a great project uh, thank you so much for being here early telling us about the weed institute located on the shores of lake manitoba uh, your open house tonight or for more information moving forward should people go to a website or you want to leave a phone number or? sure we're just at www.wheatinstitute.com and the open house is actually online so anyone can participate and you can reach out at info at weedinstitute.com for the link and that'll be important because it's going to be a foggy drive so online <laughs> might be the best way that's right. Well, we'll see if that uh, fog actually uh, breaks up by later this morning. Darcy, grateful to hear about your work here uh, in St. Laurent. Thank you so much for having me. That's Darcy Adams. She's the founder and director of the Wheat Institute. Check them out online. Time right now is 6.24 a.m. I'm Marcy Marcuso. You're on 89.3 FM, 9.90 a.m. on the app or online. We're on location in St. Laurent, Manitoba this morning and uh, grateful to be here. Lots more stories to come. But we do need to get to some news of the day next. It has now been 10 years since Canada ended its military mission in Afghanistan back in March of 2014. 10 years. Uh, the mission first started more than a decade earlier in 2001 after the September 11th attacks on the United States. A Veterans Affairs Canada held a commemorative ceremony at the National War Memorial in Ottawa on Sunday to pay tribute to the lives lost and reflect on the nation's longest war. Nelson Wiseman's with us to talk a bit about this. He's Professor Emeritus in Political Studies at the University of Toronto. Good morning. Good morning, Marcy. So if we go back in time, just to remind ourselves, uh, why were Canadian soldiers uh, involved and deployed to Afghanistan in the first place? What was the purpose? Well, the purpose was to defeat al-Qaeda, and, and Canada's role was part of a multinational, multilateral effort led by the United States, sanctioned by the United Nations, and involving NATO countries, all NATO countries, and other countries as well. That was the purpose uh, but um, it wasn't envisaged that the war would go on as long as it did. When Canada first got involved in 2001, there weren't many Canadians sent over, and the mission was supposed to end in 2003. But over the course of about 10, 12 years, it got extended six times. And how many Canadians in the end were sent there, and what do we understand about how many died or were wounded? I think about 40,000 soldiers rotated in and out, which is very, you know, that's the majority of the people in the Canadian Armed Forces at the time. 165 Canadians died, 158 of them were soldiers, seven were civilians, including a, a senior diplomat. Um, over 2,000 Canadians were wounded. and. Uh, 
the wounded rate among Canadians was quite high. It was uh, may have been the highest among uh, the Allied countries. Um, some of the deaths of the soldiers weren't from combat. They were non-combat deaths. There was a suicide. Sometimes vehicles rolled over, and there were three or four cases of friendly fire, which is Canadians accidentally shooting other Canadians. Um, so the the number of deaths was not spectacularly high, and because of that, it didn't generate that much debate in Canada. All the political parties supported the Afghan mission. Although, starting in around 2006, the NDP and the Bloc Québécois weren't calling for the immediate end of the mission, but they were calling for no more extensions. So that... Uh, let, I want to ask you about the veterans, if I may interject uh, themselves, because I know that we interviewed a veteran of the Afghan war in 2001 when the Taliban took over again, um, and he was talking about sort of feeling gutted. Uh, you know, he, he, he lost uh, people there. Uh, that he had been serving there with, and he was, he said, longing to go back to try to help uh, protect the people, which was how he saw his mission there. Uh, in your view, compared to other Canadian veterans, have veterans of Canada's war in Afghanistan struggled for recognition? Yes, I think they have. But uh, I think after the Korean War, our veterans there also struggled for some recognition, although I think they had, they got more recognition. There were more fatalities in the Korean War. It was the height of the um, the Cold War. And as it turned out, uh, South Korea became a secure democratic state. One of the reasons I think there's less attention given to uh, Canada's role in Afghanistan is because when all is said and done, at the end of the day, if we look at Afghanistan, where are we at? The Taliban are back in power. Um, uh, women who had a glimmer of light there uh, with um, schools opening for girls, jobs opening for women, that's now been shut down. So the story, in a, what was successful is defeating the uh, Al-Qaeda. But um, it didn't change it, it didn't change uh, Afghan society to become more like our society and I'm not sure it's for us to tell the Afghans how they should live. We'll leave our discussion this morning there, uh, Nelson. Thank you for marking the anniversary with us. Uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, Marcy. That's Nelson Wiseman, Professor Emeritus in Political Science at the University of Toronto. I'm Marcy Marcusa. We're on location with our team uh, here at CBC Manitoba in Communities in Focus. Uh, the community this morning in focus is St. Laurent, Manitoba, uh, on the uh, shores of Lake Manitoba. Uh, I want to mention that if you're driving out this morning, uh, you're going to want to be very, very careful with the fog. We have a fog advisory that extends across southern Manitoba, includes Winnipeg, includes this area in the interlake where I'm sitting this morning, the Red River Valley, all across the White Shell and Pemina Valley as well, near zero visibility, and that's no joke. We experienced it yesterday on the way up here to St. Laurent. So uh, that is uh, something to be aware of. Also, it could be icy. I know it's icy out here this morning. Uh, so you could be encountering that uh, wherever you are in Manitoba today as well. So especially southern Manitoba. 788-3093 is where you can reach us uh, with any uh, other tips you have on traffic to keep the drive and the commute safe. Still ahead, uh, we're going to touch base with uh, Crystal Lee Ramlikan and the business uh, news. Airplane manufacturer Boeing has been facing a lot of turbulence since that door panel blew out during a flight in January. We'll talk more about how that's affecting other airlines who are expecting planes from the company. Stay tuned. Your CBC Winnipeg News is next. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. At 6.30, it is minus 3 in Winnipeg. A little bit of mist out there. We do have a risk of freezing drizzle, and as Marcy mentioned, that fog. Uh, we expect fog patches will start to dissipate by mid-morning or early this afternoon. Still warmer than seasonal, a high today of 3. Manitobans earning minimum wage will get a boost later this year. The lowest earners will see a 50 cent boost in October to $15.80 an hour. The new wage was determined based on a legislative formula tying annual increases to inflation. Labor Minister Malaya Marcelino says the government's weighing the interests of workers 
and business. We're a party that is here to fight for the rights and protections and health and safety of workers every day of the week. So um, they're always a top priority for me as Labour Minister, but we do have to balance all interests with the rest of Manitoba. That includes business interests too. The NDP government actually could have raised the minimum wage late last year, but decided to pass. Legislation allows for an increase beyond the formula if inflation is high enough. Marcelino says the government didn't have enough time to study the issue and consult before December. The man in charge of high school sports in Manitoba says he is concerned about an alleged incident of hazing. It involves the Prairie Mountain Mustang boys hockey team. It draws players from several rural schools. Two school divisions confirm they are investigating, as is the RCMP. Chad Falk at the Manitoba High School's Athletic Association says it's disappointing to learn hazing hasn't been completely eliminated from hockey culture. As an administrator and as a parent myself, you know, it, it's very disturbing uh, hearing that this has not changed given everything that's been going on uh, as of late. I realize there's a long history of this. Falk says he believes the police and the divisions involved are working hard on this investigation and are keeping open communication with the families of everyone on the team. Manitobans from Haiti are concerned for their families as the country is embroiled in crisis. Armed gangs have taken over the capital, Port-au-Prince. Gunmen have burned police stations, government buildings, closed the airport and raided the prison. Haiti's prime minister has announced he will resign once a replacement is chosen. Marie Pudwell moved from Haiti to Winnipeg in 2008. She says her family back home is living in constant fear. It is so unsafe. They cannot go out at night on the street. Even during the day, you cannot go out, you know, on the street. You cannot drive. And everything is so expensive. And, you know, the insecurity, it's so hard. Pudwell says one of her family members has been kidnapped and they don't have money to pay ransom. The interim leader of Manitoba's Conservative Party believes parents should be informed if their child wants to change their pronouns. Wayne Uosco wants to ensure parents are involved. Whether it's the topic of pronouns, whether it's other topics within the education world, I don't think it's a bad thing. Why would we want to uh, hide various topics away from parents and guardians? Iwasco was a school teacher and guidance counselor for many years. He says the vast majority of the time, school staff can help students communicate with their parents and alleviate fears about how their parents will react. Iwasco says school counselors can work with families who struggle to communicate. A Winnipeg doctor is suing after she was injured when a parkade elevator near the Health Sciences Centre suddenly dropped while she was inside. Chow Pham says she suffers chronic pain and psychological trauma after the incident two years ago. In court documents, Pham claims Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, Shared Health and the elevator manufacturer neglected to make sure the elevator was safe. Pham had parked on the fourth floor of the, an Emily Street parkade. On the trip down, she says the elevator dropped and she fell forward. She says the elevator then stopped suddenly, causing serious injuries to her spinal cord and legs. Pham now has permanent disabilities and is suing for lost income and damages. Well, it is now official. Joe Biden and Donald Trump will be their party's presidential candidates. In a rematch, polls suggest most Americans don't want. After yesterday's primaries, they have enough delegates to put their names on November's ballot. Both men releasing videos after the results were known. Come November, we will vote in record numbers. And we can do it. It's within your power to do it. Hello, everyone. It's your favorite president speaking to you on a really great day of victory. This one got us over the top. This will be the first presidential rematch since 1956. That's when Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower again defeated Adlai Stevenson. You can hear the latest national and international news coming up on World Report at 7. And you can find more Manitoba news updated throughout the day at cbc.ca slash Manitoba. All right. Thank you, Heather Wells. You're welcome.
6.36 a.m. is the time right now on 89.390 on the app or online this morning. Uh, and we are out in St. Laurent, Manitoba. Big thanks to uh, Barb and Mike Futros for having us. Our location this morning, the morning show live at MTT Petro Canada on Highway 6. There's a diner in the back here. I feel like I'm in a log cabin. The walls are all uh, covered in wood and there's a pitched roof uh, with wood on the wall, with uh, wood ceiling. And we've got beautiful local art surrounding us. And no surprise that a lot of it is uh, images of the lake and of, uh, of creatures that live in bodies of water. And that is because we're very near Lake Manitoba. We can't see it this morning, though, I suspect, because of the fog. My first guest this half hour was already remarking on it. Uh, there is an advisory. Abby's in to tell us about that and the rest of your regional forecast. Yes, thanks, Marcy. We are at minus three on the cloudy skies. Today will be mainly cloudy in the city. We should be seeing, uh, we're expecting a risk of uh, freezing drizzle this morning also. And fog, yes, the, uh, the dense fog is actually affecting southern Manitoba this morning and also various parts of the uh, southern part of the province, including the city of Winnipeg, the Red River Valley, Pembina Valleys, the Interlake, uh, the uh, East Manitoba, and the White Shell. This is affecting, and uh, it's going to be causing a near zero visibility due to the thick fog. We should expect uh, uh, treacherous uh, conditions while we travel this morning. For uh, Brandon, it's chilly at zero. Thompson is at minus nine. For the North, Churchill is at minus 11 and foggy. Uh, Dauphin is also cloudy right now at minus two. Gimli is at minus one. Steinbeck at minus three. And Morris is at minus one. All right. Thank you, Abby. And I know the phone's ringing and you're really doing everything back there know, in the Marcy. studio. So listen, if you have a traffic tip to uh, tell us about that needs to be on air, we'll just watch for it and we'll get you on air and just uh, let us know. OK. Definitely. Right, 788- Seven eight eight three zero nine three. Corey actually has some uh, traffic to deliver here. We just aren't getting the phones forwarded. We're having some technical challenge with that. So, Corey, what should we say about the roads? Yeah, it really is just that uh, that fog advisory this morning is the biggest issue. Uh, so, if you're driving here in the Interlake down through Winnipeg and then through the Red River Pemna Valley and then uh, White Shell as well, uh, that's going to be the biggest issue for you uh, this morning is that fog throwing off your visibility and some ice. I think I know that this morning my car window is not that I drove anywhere but they were all iced over. So mm -hmm. it's real spring weather where it's kind of going to be a little bit sketchy that out there. That melt and that freeze, it always uh, makes things a little sketchy out there on the road. So give me a call. Uh, uh, we're hoping to forward that to my phone here in St. Laurent using technology. Give it 204-788-3093 and I'll hopefully be able to answer that phone uh, here. One of the stories around this part of Manitoba <laughs> is the fact that they have challenges with cell service. Yes. Uh, and I know that when we covered floods around this part of Manitoba, we uh, had covered that aspect before. So people for a long time here have been saying, you know, we need some better service. We're just an hour from Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. uh, it is 6.39 a.m. We're grateful to be broadcasting this morning from here. I want to mention one story in the news before we turn to business news. Uh, as you heard Heather mention, the interim leader of Manitoba's Conservative Party saying he believes parents should be informed if the child wants to change their pronouns. Uh, we will take listener lines on this this morning. We'll get your calls on the air about uh, whatever you think of that uh, throughout the program. So we'll get them on a little later. If you want to call on that story and weigh in, uh, if you're a parent, of course, would love to hear from you. 788-3205, 788-3205 if you want to uh, reach us on our listener line. Well, Crystal Lee Ramlikan does join us now with Business News. Hi there. Hi, good morning, Marcy. So as I mentioned uh, before the news, air airplane manufacturer Boeing uh, has been facing a lot since that door panel blew out during the flight in January. How is it affecting now airlines who are expecting planes from the company? Well, the New York Times is reporting a six-week audit by the Federal Aviation Administration found dozens of problems throughout the manufacturing process. And so these quality control issues, slow increase in output, and running years behind schedule are all forcing uh, some of Boeing's biggest customers to rethink their growth plans now. So Southwest Airlines, which only flies Boeing 737, says it may have to cut flights later this year, setting fewer deliveries than expected, 46 down from 79. Alaska Airlines is also uncertain about how many planes it's going to get. United is pausing pilot hiring because new planes are arriving late. And here in Canada, WestJet is also facing costly delays of aircraft. So for more on this, we spoke to John Graddick, who is a lecturer at McGill University's Aviation Management Program. Boeing has a plan or has a plan to basically build somewhere between 60 and 70 airplanes a month. Um, and they're nowhere near that. I think the last the last month of deliveries was 
somewhere around 29 or 30 airplanes. So they're, they're really underperforming in terms of the market's expectations of what Boeing has said it could deliver in terms of airplanes. Now, Boeing says it's focused on changes to strengthen quality, and it is staying in close contact with its customers about issues. But uh, Marcy, the company's stock is down almost 30% so far this year. Uh, to another story, Crystal Lee, Canadian beef producers and the federal government are raising concerns about new made-in-the-USA labels on meat, on poultry, and actually on eggs as well. Why? Well, they say that these labels could disrupt supply chains. So a new rule says the labels may be used only when the products come from animals born, raised, slaughtered, and processed in the U.S. And so this new rule is supposed to take effect in 2026. But Canadian officials say the new rule doesn't take into account the important trading relationship between our two countries. So they say the meat and livestock sectors in Canada and U.S. work closely together. And uh, the current policy allows use of voluntary labels on products from animals that have been imported from a foreign country and slaughtered in the U.S. or meat that's been imported and repackaged or further processed. So that's the two differences now. So for more on this, here's Dennis Leecraft, who is with the Canadian Cattle Association. And we're disappointed that they really went with a very prescriptive and restrictive definition. There were there were certainly other alternatives, even ones they had uh, previously mentioned themselves that would have respected the integrated market that exists between Canada, US and Mexico under the Canada, US, Mexico agreement. So, and we're concerned that it is potentially going to lead to impacts in the marketplace that may unfairly discriminate against our exports of live animals. So Canadian officials intend to raise this issue during the agriculture minister's trilateral meeting with the U.S. and Mexico scheduled to take place in Colorado later this month. Well, there'll be people from the area where we're sitting this morning leaning in. Uh, St. Laurent has always had a diverse uh, economic base, but uh, the wide land out here uh, means there are a lot of uh, ranchers and, uh, and agricultural producers around the lake that, uh, that work the land. So they'll be leaning into that. Uh, finally, this morning, a new study shows that Canadian independent cinemas are struggling. How much? What can you tell us? Yes, so 60% of independent cinemas operated at a loss at the end of last year. That's according to a new survey by the industry. So about two thirds reported that they need increased public funding in order to remain operational. The bulk estimate that they would need about $50,000 in extra funding annually for three years to close the immediate gaps that they're facing right now. And of course, we know the industry is still recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, which temporarily closed theaters. Some other things that the industry would like to see to help it, the elimination of clean runs. So that's when the studios demand two, three, or even four week runs for films. And then independent theaters can only show one film during every showtime. And studios deny requests to spare even a single other screen for other movies. And, uh, you know, if it's a single screen cinema in a small community, it's really hard for a cinema to sustain a film for that long, showing the same film uh, for, you know, a month. Now, they also want to see a thing called zone provisions go away. So more than half said they have to wait for Cineplex, which is the largest cinema chain in the country, to stop showing a film in their zone so uh, they can screen the same movie. How are markets looking this morning? So in Europe, markets are lower as investigators digest the latest U.S. inflation report. But right now, Germany, the U.K. and France are all slightly up. In Asia, markets are mixed. Japan, Shanghai and Hong Kong are all down. Oil is up $1.19 to $78.76 U.S. per barrel. Gold is up $1 to $2,167.10 U.S. per ounce. And the dollar is flat at $74.12 U.S. All right. Thanks very much, Crystal Lee. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks, Marcy. Chris Lee Ramlikan from our uh, national uh, business desk.
It is uh, right now 6.45 a.m. on 89.3 FM, 9.90 a.m. or on the app this morning. Thank you so much for joining us here on Information Radio. Well, as I mentioned, we are live in St. Laurent, Manitoba. And uh, thank you uh, to all of the people here who have been so welcoming to our team. This is Communities in Focus, which means we have people on site all week long. Our morning show here live, though, at MTT Diner on Highway 6 at the Petrocan. So uh, we uh, we uh, welcome you here if you want to join us to watch the show or to be part of things uh, here this this morning. In Winnipeg, though, if you are, are driving, actually anywhere in southern Manitoba, including here, there's freezing fog. There's a, a lot of it. There's an advisory that has been issued, and a visibility at times is going to be near zero. So uh, be very, very careful if you have to travel this morning. In Winnipeg right now, it's minus three, and today the daytime high will be three. Here in St. Laurent, the uh, it's zero right now, and the high today will be two, but there's going to be ice pellets here this morning. Well, next on the show, uh, we are going to our medical column this morning. It's uh, Wednesday morning. That means Dr. Raj Bardwaj has the medical column. And spring is official next week. Officially starts on March 19th. For a lot of people, you start thinking about spring cleaning at home. Those tasks you do once a year to start fresh, cleaning the garage, sorting through old clothes in the closet. But Raj Bardwaj, our medical columnist, says there is medical spring cleaning that you might consider as well, and he joined us to explain. Good morning, Marcy. So what kind of tasks should be on our medical spring cleaning list? Yeah, I think one of the easiest and kind of fun ones maybe is um, going through your medicine cabinet and your first aid kit and just sort of making sure that everything in there is, is up to date and organized. A um, couple of other things, I hate to say it, but I'm going through my tax receipts these days. So I also try to gather any sort of tax receipts for health-related expenses and stuff that might be relevant. Um, and then while you're in amongst your files, you might want to make sure that your travel vaccination documents are all sorted and stored with your passport and make sure that you're up to date on your vaccinations as well. Uh, particularly relevant this year with measles becoming more widespread and the updated COVID vaccine still available. Um, and if it's been a few years since you've thought about it, not a bad idea to make sure you've talked to your loved ones about uh, your medical directive and which is things like, you know, do you want to be an organ donor and what kind of um, extraordinary care would you like or not like if you end up in the intensive care unit or something like that. And it's just like you said, just like cleaning up your garage or, or whatever. These aren't tasks that need doing every year, um, but it really does help if you tackle them once in a while. I think you'll feel better knowing that they're done and you'll be more prepared for any sort of little medical issues or big medical issues that, that um you know, sort of come up unexpectedly. What should people keep in mind when going through the medicine cabinet, as you mentioned? Yeah, so medications do expire, and they can become less effective after their expiry date. So one option would be to basically look at the expiry dates and throw out anything that's expired and buy a new version of it, and maybe buy a smaller amount if there's a lot that went unused. Um, but some people might want to keep some things that aren't too much past their expiry dates, especially for meds that aren't really sort of mission critical or likely to be contaminated. Um, so a couple of examples, eye drops. Um, so if the bottle has been opened, then, you know, but even if it's sealed, uh, if it's expired, I would say throw it out because you never wanted to take chances with your eyes. On the other hand, something like antacid tablets or um, throat lozenges, right? Maybe you could use those if they're not long expired. Just be aware that they might be less effective or maybe not effective at all. But they're not sort of as mission critical in my mind. If they don't work quite as well, then it's not the end of the world. The other thing I should mention is if you are going to throw out medications, it's best to sort of collect them and take them into the drugstore. Uh, please don't flush them. That is the worst way to get rid of things. Um, so yeah, just uh, take them into the drugstore and, and they'll take them and properly dispose of them there. I know that you uh, you touched this on a previous column, but a lot of us still have the the COVID rapid test kits, and people might even want to take some to travel. But many of those have expired now. Yeah, uh, that is one of those interesting ones. The the manufacturers can't endorse using the kits after the expiry date, and by the book, neither can I. But there's a lot of good real world evidence, sort of citizen science and actual science science. Um, that these kits are still giving accurate, positive results as long as you get a good control line when you run the test. Just be aware that the sensitivity of the kit might be lower if it's long expired. And again, I wouldn't use expired ones if it's mission critical to your decision making. You know, if it's, you know, should I go visit grandma at the 
at the retirement home and if I, you know, I feel badly, you know, I feel sick or whatever, but I test negative, I'm going to go. Nuh uh. If you feel unwell, even if you test negative, especially with an expired kit, I would still, you know, have second thoughts about going. Um, but again, if you're headed to the drugstore to replenish some of your medicine cabinet uh, supplies or first aid kit supplies or, or to get rid of some of your, your expired meds, you can ask to see if they have more of those free test kits to hand out. You, you, first aid kits, speaking of which, what should people uh, clean up from those? Yeah, usually it's it's more about replenishing supplies you've used up over the months or years. Uh, people use up Band-Aids or gauze or whatever and never restock it. And, and then you can be short of something when you need it most. Um, so I like to have a, sort of a main first aid kit, or usually it's like a, a, a you know a cabinet. And then I just pack limited supplies into smaller bags that I can take to different things. You know, So if I'm going hiking, I might take a different kind of kit than if I'm going on a beach vacation, for example. But after a few trips, the supplies get all disorganized. So it's worth going through everything um, when you're not in a first aid situation so that you've got enough stuff and that it's well organized. Um, and if you same if you keep a long forgotten first aid kit or even a road safety kit in your car, same thing. Go through it, make sure that you know the gloves haven't dried up and cracked. For example, the tape hasn't gone all funny from being stored in the, in the heat and the cold. Things like that. I was just looking at that in the back of my car uh, as we were uh, making our way out to Saint Laurent <laughs> and thinking, man, I haven't opened that uh, bag in a while. That car safety kit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's nice to know what's in there and what's not in there when you open the bag when you actually need it. Right? Yes, right. It's that. Uh, it's 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 the theme of everything you're saying this morning. Not waiting until it's critical. Uh, before you do go, are there any other spring cleaning type tasks from a medical point of view you want to mention? Yeah, this is a tough one. You know, one thing that, that people either put off or forget is that you should also probably go in and get a checkup from time to time, whether it's a dentist for a cleaning or an optometrist for an eye checkup every few years, even if you don't wear glasses. Also, hearing tests if you're starting to get older. There's lots of good evidence that proactive screening for things like this can, can help to find health issues before they become big enough to actually cause symptoms. Um, and catching things early and making sure that we're proactive about keeping people healthy and not just sort of dealing with problems as they arise is partly what family doctors are excellent at. But here's the kicker. There's obviously a huge shortage of family doctors and proactive health care all over the country. So unfortunately, that means you have to be your own advocate when it comes to making sure that you've had the screening test that you should at the right age that you should be having it. So things like breast cancer screening with mammograms or colonoscopy to screen for bowel cancer. Those are really important, but more people are going to fall through the crack of the primary health care system. So it's worth turning your attention to that sort of thing once in a while. Um, again, just like spring cleaning, and call 811 or, or your family doctor if you're lucky enough to have one and talk about how to access that sort of proactive health care. All right, Dr. Barwash, thank you very much. My pleasure. That's Dr. Raj Bardwaj uh, with our medical column. I always like to remind you, if you have an idea for Dr. Bardwaj uh, that you want featured on the column, uh, give us a call and we'll pass it along. 788-3205. For breaking news as it happens, stay with CBC News. For the latest updates and what it means for Canadians, stay with CBC News. When the biggest stories break, both at home and around the world, Stay with CBC News. I'm Marcy Marcuso on location with CBC Manitoba's Information Radio. The morning show is in St. Laurent, Manitoba this morning. We are focusing on this community, which is about 1,500 people, but it swells in the summertime to over 4,000, and that's because we're by the lake. Uh, lake Manitoba, that is. So we're going to hear more in the next hour, including the story of these three amazing women. We have uh, traditional Métis recipes. I love that. So it's okay. meatball in the chef. Boulette. Trois livres d'hamburger, un oignon. See, I can see right there you said onion, <coughs> but you didn't say l'oignon. You said oignon. Oignon, oignon. There's a Y in there. Yeah, oignon. Is the Y present in a lot of the language? I noticed that also in some yeah, of the other words. Like famille here says, uh, or if, if you say it in French, it's F-A-M-I-L-L-E. That's famille. Famille. Yeah, famille. famille. But here, famille, f a m i. Y L. We write it like we pronounce it. We taught ourselves how to write it. Nobody taught us for how to write it. For this book? Yes. yes.
We're going to learn about the book that they put together, how they've been honored, and breaking news. They have a second book in the works. They want to preserve their Machif French language. They also want to preserve the culture and the history uh, around this, about this part of Manitoba. So where are we this morning? Well, if you've never been to this part of Manitoba, St. Laurent is about uh, 70 kilometers uh, northwest of Winnipeg, as I mentioned, on, on the lake. And this is a vibrant place uh, where the community is, the Métis community itself is considered one of the largest in uh, North America, in fact. It's featured in the Smithsonian uh, for that fact. If you're driving around here, uh, it's hard uh, not to notice sort of the mix of, uh, of community here. And Corey Funk and I were out yesterday. Um, I know we're close to news, Corey, but you have a minute uh, that you spent with a person yeah. actually that, that loves the place you too. Know, I just brought my mic around while I was hanging out here around this really big kind of complex. It's not just a gas station, but uh, it's. Uh, I was just hanging around here. I ended up chatting uh, with uh, Brandy Chartrand. She works here in the restaurant at M. TT. And I just asked her what she loves about living here in St. Laurent. I think mostly the locals, like just having everybody, everybody knows everybody, right? So it's, it's easy, it's fun, it's quiet, you know, there's nothing really to get crazy about out here, so... Did you grow up here? I did. I did. I grew up here, and I've lived here pretty much my whole life, so it's not so bad. <laughs> Especially in the summertime. Summertime is really, really nice. What's like your favorite place to go here in the, in the area? The beach. Yeah, definitely the beach. Especially in the summertime. Like, I feel like when people people don't realize how nice the beaches there are in this part of the province. Is that right? Yeah, they don't actually. It's I don't know, it's, I guess for being way far out here, people don't really think that there's too much because you pass by and like you blink and it's gone, right? So there is a lot of beautiful things about St. Laurent though. We're going to hear more about residents who love all things St. Laurent in the next hour, including the beach. But which beach? There's Twin Lake beaches, there's Sandpiper Beach, there's Laurentia Beach. We're going to talk more about that as well. We're broadcasting from this part of the province, but right now let's go to Heather Wells with headlines. Well, after missing an opportunity to boost pay last year, Manitoba will hike minimum wage to $15.80 in October. The Labour Minister says the new government lacked time to study, consult and consult on wage increases back in 2023. Manitobans from Haiti are worried for their families who are still in that country where armed gangs have taken over the capital. Marie Podwell moved from Haiti to Winnipeg in 2008. She says her family back home is living in constant fear. We're going to hear more from her in our next local news at 7.30. All right. Thanks very much, Heather Wells. You're welcome. It is now coming up to 7 a.m. Be careful with the fog advisory out there and 788-3093 if you need to reach us. Could be a little icy. We've got freezing fog in Winnipeg and it's minus 3. Here in St. Laurent, it is uh, 0 and a high of 2 today. Ice pellets expected this morning and you're also under that fog advisory. So uh, be careful out there, everybody. It is a tough one. Coming up on Information Radio in the next hour of the program, the Reeve is going to be here to talk about the challenges and the joys of uh, being the leader in this program. Part of Manitoba. In addition, we're going to hear more from those lovely ladies who are trying to preserve Machif French. So stay tuned for those stories. And we're going to meet a man who went through the most devastating thing of his life in the flood of 2011, but he decided to stay in this part of the province. Day on the current. It is literally the hottest drug in the country right now. Now it's just not celebrities anymore. Everybody's taking it. It has been called the miracle drug by celebrities looking to lose weight, but the diabetes medication Ozempic has origins closer to Canada. Coming up, the Canadian doctor whose research helped pave the way for Ozempic. The Current with Matt Galloway. This morning at 837, 907 in Newfoundland and on the CBC Listen app. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. The president of Lithuania has a message for Russian President Vladimir Putin. Nobody is afraid of you here. Gitanas Nuseda's comments come after one of Alexei Navalny's top aides was attacked in Lithuania's capital. Leonid Volkov was a close colleague of the late Russian opposition leader. Police are now investigating, but Volkov was attacked just hours after speaking out against Putin in an interview. Anna Cunningham has the details. 
our work is full of very complicated challenges. Leonid Volkov, Alexei Navalny's chief of staff, speaking yesterday in an interview with Reuters just hours before he was attacked outside his home in the Lithuanian capital Vilnius. In what now seems bizarrely predictive, he acknowledged the risk to his personal safety. We know that Putin does not only kill people inside Russia, he also kills people outside Russia. Pictures online show him with a bloodied leg, bruising to his forehead and a broken arm. His car window was smashed, tear gas sprayed, and he was then reportedly beaten with a hammer. Associates of Navalny claimed this was a clear political attack. It will be concerning for Navalny's team, with early voting already open in places for Russia's presidential election, including in the Russian-controlled city of Donetsk in eastern Ukraine. Polling in Russia opens Friday and closes Sunday as Russian President Vladimir Putin seeks a fifth term. It's a vote that he is nearly certain to win, with only three Kremlin-approved opposition candidates on the ballot. In the past few days, Putin is understood to sack the commander of Russia's navy after it suffered a series of humiliating losses in the Black Sea. Ahead of this weekend's presidential elections, Putin spoke to Russian media, asserting his credentials. He said technically they are ready for nuclear war and that if U.S. troops appear in Ukraine, he will treat them as interventionists. Anna Cunningham for CBC News, London. It is a rematch everyone saw coming, but it is now official. Americans will once again head to the polls for a Joe Biden-Donald Trump presidential race. Come November, we will vote in record numbers, and we can do it. It's within your power to do it. Hello, everyone. It's your favorite president speaking to you on a really great day of victory. This one got us over the top. Both Biden and Trump released videos shortly after primaries were held in three states last night. Each candidate secured the number of delegates needed to clinch their party's nomination. This is the first time since 1956 that the U.S. has had a presidential rematch. In, this, in his video message, Biden called for voters to defend democracy in the upcoming election. Trump instead took direct aim at Biden, calling him the worst president in the country's history. Americans will vote for their next president on November the 5th. The murder of members of an Ottawa family is making headlines in their home country. A mother and her four children were killed in a mass stabbing last week. Her husband, the children's father, survived. A family friend was also killed in the attack. All of them, including the alleged attacker, are from Sri Lanka. As Arthur White Crummy reports, it has left people in that country desperate for answers. It's seen as this sort of safe haven, this, oh, we finally made it place to get to. That's how Sri Lankan journalist Tarushi Wirasinga describes the image of Canada in her country. But now Sri Lankans are seeing other images of tragedy and loss as local journalists track down relatives mourning a Sri Lankan mother and her four children and a man killed in an Ottawa suburb last week. They were just starting to live out this dream that they had. It's a powerful narrative especially when the accused killer was a former Sri Lankan student living in their home. So it's no wonder the story is getting massive play in the Sri Lankan media. Azam Amin runs a news website in the capital, Colombo. It has been dominating the news agenda and uh, it's all over the social media as well. People are still looking for answers. But answers are hard to come by. Amin has watched other websites and social media fill the void with rumors, blaming everything from visa issues to video games to find a motive in the absence of facts. Those kind of things are very uh, common here. Sulukana Mohan is deputy editor of Ceylon Today, which has already run two front page stories about the Ottawa killings and might run more as the case winds its way through the courts. We will be waiting and watching the action, seriously watching over this, uh, the developments. Hoping for a revelation that will reveal what happened that night and why. Arthur White Crummy, CBC News, Ottawa. Later today, we will hear testimony from the partners of GC Strategies. That firm got the biggest contract to work on the ArriveCan app. Now MPs are studying how it was awarded, and they've summoned the partners to appear before committee or be taken into custody by the House of Commons Sergeant-at-Arms. Kate McKenna is following the story for us from Parliament Hill, uh, par- our parliamentary bureau there. And Kate, what will you be watching for at committee today? 
We can expect some of what the Auditor General said to be put directly to Christian Firth and Darren Anthony. This is the first time the partners of GC Strategies have spoken since last month's scathing Auditor General's report. It questions the basics of why their company was chosen for a $25 million contract. Karen Hogan says she can't find much documentation to show why or how GC Strategies was chosen to work on ArriveCan. Her report says she couldn't even determine which government official chose GC Strategies. Today's hearings will be the latest in a series of probes over the ballooning cost of the app. The Auditor General couldn't find a full accounting of how much it cost, but estimates taxpayers paid about $60 million, a price tag considerably higher than initial estimates. At the centre of the controversy is GC Strategies. The company consists of only two people. They declined to appear twice before, in November and last month, citing concerns about their mental health. The government suspended all of its current contracts with GC Strategies in November. Last week, Public Services and Procurement Canada announced it was effectively banning the company from bidding on new contracts with security requirements. But parliamentarians say they still have questions about what happened with ArriveCan. Thanks, Kate. That is the CBC's Kate McKenna reporting from Ottawa. When a Newfoundland HVAC company abruptly closed last year, customers were worried about their payments and warranties, with good reason. The owner, Raymond Kalonga, was already in legal and financial trouble in Ontario. Now a CBC News investigation has revealed Kalonga has a trail of debts, broken promises and a warrant for his arrest. Ariana Kelland reports. Daphne Sheaves has two heat pumps, but for months she was paying for three. So in October of this year, my first payment comes out. And the payment that came out was for the $14,000 loan, not the $9,000 loan. The heat pumps were from St. John's company Atlantic Standard HVAC. Sheaves isn't the only customer complaining about incorrect bills and trouble accessing warranties. 36-year-old Raymond Kalonga is the owner. He told CBC News in January he was working to make things right. Kalonga said he wasn't taking new customers, but would serve the ones he has. In this company, even when you fail... That's Kalonga pumping up employees with his previous company, Canadian Standard Home Services in Ontario. Two weeks ago, an Ontario Justice of the Peace called Kalonga deceitful in his actions with that company. She sentenced him to 525 days in jail and handed the company a more than half million dollar fine. All for charges under Ontario's Consumer Protection Act for door-to-door sales tactics that were false, deceptive and misleading. Kalonga says he plans to appeal. You enter into agreements with people and you think that they're upstanding and ethical and obviously not everyone is. Sheaves' contract got corrected after CBC contacted the company that financed the purchase. But other customers are left wondering what's next. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Listen to this, Neil Young fans. You can stream his music on Spotify again. Because I'm still in love with you I want to see Young demanded his music be pulled off the streaming platform two years ago. He was protesting Spotify's failure to curb misinformation about COVID-19 that aired on the podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience. Young says he decided to bring his music back to Spotify because now Apple and Amazon are also failing to curb misinformation. And he can't pull his music off these platforms. Young says he would be limiting streaming options to music lovers. His profile and music are back up on the platform now. Spotify says monthly, more than 3 million listeners stream Neil Young's music. I love you with all my heart. That is World Report. I'm Marcia Young. Bonjour or allo. Ce matin, on... on on est sur la radio CBC. OK, la radio de Saint-Laurent, Manitoba. Tu viendras à Saint-Laurent, tu vas apprendre à parler le métier français. That is right. We're going to learn a little bit about Mitchif French this morning. We are live in Saint-Laurent, Manitoba. I'm Marcy Marcuse. This is Communities in Focus on CBC. And we're set up live at MTT Diner just off Highway 6 of the Petrocan. Good morning. Got some folks in here having their morning coffee listening to the show. Those women you heard were part of a group of five women that took five years 
uh, spending time writing a book. It was a labor of love for their language. We're going to hear uh, from three of them, the St. Laurent authors, who wrote about a dialect of French that they grew up with in this part of Manitoba and how they're fighting to still save it today and hear it spoken all over by their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So stay tuned, we'll get that story. Also this hour on the show, the Reeve is going to join us. What's it like to be the leader of a community that's population swells to more than double in the summer months? We're going to talk to him at 10 to 8. Stay with us. We're live in St. Laurent. You're going to notice me saying it both ways all morning, St. Laurent and St. Laurent. I'm hearing it both ways here, so it's fair game. I also want to mention that uh, one of the last times that I spent serious time around this uh, Lake Manitoba and uh, in the St. Laurent community was during the devastating historic flood of 2011, one of the most devastating in our province, and it happened right here on the lake. If that seems like a long time ago... It did take years and years for this area to recover. So we have a resident who says his favorite turning point moment was a friend who said, quote, it seems like everything's in color again. So how does he feel about his community today? We're going to talk to him in this half hour of the show. Right now, let's go to Heather Wells to find out what's happening in news uh, from her Winnipeg perspective. She's in our studio there. Good morning. Good morning. Well, the person in charge of Manitoba High School sports hopes justice can be found for the victim or victims of an alleged incident of hazing in hockey. The RCMP and two school divisions are investigating the Prairie Mountain Mustangs. That team draws players from several rural schools. We'll hear from the Manitoba High Schools Athletic Association coming up. And the interim leader of Manitoba's Conservative Party believes parents should be informed if their child wants to change their pronouns. Wayne Iwasco wants to ensure parents are involved. He says the vast majority of the time school staff can help students communicate with their parents. We'll hear more in our next news. News at 7.30. Thank you very much, Heather. Well, let's get to traffic. Uh, Corey Funk is covering traffic. He's here with us in St. Laurent, but uh, I know that you're answering the phone from Winnipeg. It's been forwarded. Yes, yes. I mean, the biggest issue is obviously that fog advisory, that fog that's making things pretty visible, pretty not very visible, uh, particularly up here in the interlake, through down to Winnipeg, through the Pemna Valley, and then also uh, east of Winnipeg, uh, through the White Shell and eastern Manitoba as well. Poor visibility on the highways. Also got a call from Thomas, who says there's actually freezing rain going on right now around Russell. So Highway uh, Highway 16 and Highway 41 are actually starting to get pretty slippery from that freezing rain. So careful if you're driving in the Russell area. uh, Maybe just slow down a little bit, uh, keep your wits about you. Other than that, things seem to be running fairly smoothly so far. But if you see something else going on, give me a call here in St. Laurent uh, on the CBC commuter line. Technology, cool stuff. 204-788-3093. Now we cover traffic first, but let's actually get into the forecast now. Abby? will tell us more about that fog advisory that uh, Corey mentioned. Hi, Abby. Good morning once again, Marcy. Yes, the southern part of the province is foggy. Winnipeg is foggy right now with a temperature at minus three degrees. You need to take it easy on, on the roads because uh, visibility is something you should put into consideration today. In Winnipeg, expect mainly cloudy skies with a chance of freezing drizzle later in the morning. We'll be reaching a high of three. In Brandon, it's chilly at zero. Thompson is at minus nine. Churchill is at minus 11. Duffin is at minus two. But once again, Winnipeg, we are getting to a high of three today. Well, as we've been mentioning, St. Laurent's population grows by thousands in the summer months, but some folks who live on the water are here year-round. And Jim Stevenson, my next guest, is one of those people. He actually shared his story with us back in 2011 when Lake Manitoba was experiencing, as I mentioned, uh, a historic flood. Jim's deck was the site of our morning show broadcast. Uh, Jim and I dragged a cable out, I remember, through his house to get out and be looking at the lake. He lives just about five kilometers up the road here, south of here in Twin Lakes Beach, but he is with us now at MTT. Diner. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Mercy. So you stuck it out in this area of Manitoba. What do you love about it to make you do that? You know, it's it's, it's just a great community. It's um, it's a really accepting community. We we came out here in the early '80s and uh, moved permanently here in the, I think it was '05. And uh, it's just a friendly community at a good location, close to town, and beautiful. The summers and winters are are absolutely wonderful. Uh, the winter, people talk about the summer, but the winter is really serene, and, and when that lake's frozen, it's a beautiful thing to look at. What do you like doing uh, in the winter months out this way? 
Uh, we we do a little bit of ice fishing, not a lot. My son does a lot when he comes out. Um, it's it's a lot of walking and you know some cross country skiing, which we haven't done in the last couple of years. But uh, it's it's just a a real nice place to, to be winter and summer. I saw people actually yesterday when we were driving around trying to look at the lake, but the fog prevented that. I saw people with walking sticks actually out yeah. getting their exercise in. So lots of people out and about. Um, you stayed here, but how many didn't after the flood? Like, did you lose friends and neighbors uh, because of the devastation around this part of Manitoba? You know, not a lot of people. I, I, I didn't hear of a lot of people that sold out. There was a lot of people that didn't come much, and, and after the, the flood gave up on it. Um, and there was, there was some, sadly enough, a few deaths in the area that uh, never did have a chance to come back and see it revitalized. But as far as the people that live here permanently, uh, I would say 90, 95% of them came back. It's, it's, it's got its draw. I mean, I could see the people in Point Douglas when they finally gave up. It would be tough. But with our flood, it was, um, we feel it was a man-made flood. And it probably will never happen again, so we're just enjoying our little slice of Manitoba. Yeah. Um, what was the reality for you in terms of the house? Did you, did you, you raised the house, right, for protection? Yeah, we did. We, uh, we actually, I was lucky enough, I, I'm involved with a group of Winnipeg clubs that, uh, it's, it's a hockey team, and we do a little stuff in the community. And one of our fellows was working with an indigenous band on the north side of Lake Manitoba, and he came in and warned me ahead of time what was happening and it was it was surreal you know when he showed where how far we could be from land if 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 it came the way it could come so we we did a lot of preventative stuff on the house wrapped the whole front of the house in plastic and sandbag giant sandbags in front so we saved the house completely but after the case the government came in and did a wonderful job of supporting us and um, and anybody who chose to stay if it was a permanent residence they allowed us to build our house up and lift it and uh, we had a local company lift the house up and build a pony wall around it and it's it's back to as good as new if not better i love that quote uh, you know when you guys turned the corner and you said your friend said it looks like everything's in color again it's such a good line it, yeah it was that was dave seaford a friend of mine from down the lake he uh, it, it, it during the flood it was it was devastating it was everybody was uh well, I remember the images. I mean, this is why are we revisiting? People might be thinking all these years later, 2011. I mean, houses were hanging over the lake because the shoreline had eroded. They were held on by by wires that were on the, yeah. you know, the overhead service wires to the overhead poles, you know, and like they were taut. And I remember it just looking at that image and it never got out of my head. What do you think is the future of this part of Manitoba and St. Laurent? What are you excited about? Uh, on the phone, you said to me when I was asking you to come on down that it was back better than ever, you thought. Yeah, I really believe that it's uh, where it has been rebuilt. It's uh, it's it's beautiful, and it. I think people are starting to realize that it's not that far from Winnipeg. It's you know it's half an hour to get to the perimeter. I've been commuting for almost 20 years, and it's uh, it, you know it, it's nice to get out of the city. If you're not from the city originally, like myself, it's it's just a beautiful mix of the city and the country. It's it's nice and close, and we've got the lake. <laughs> What uh, what growth are you excited about in the future? Because it, it, it could go different ways. Um, because I'm, I know now, even the business we're in right now is expanding because the population expands so much. They just want a bigger restaurant, a bigger bar back here, a bigger space for gathering. Uh, but also when you drive around, of course, we have the agricultural land and you see the, the horses and animals on the land uh, and then the cottage population in the summer. So can it go in all those directions for growth, or do you think that, that it needs a singular vision? What are your thoughts on how you'd like to see it change or grow? That's a tough one. It, it, you know, I, I think the, uh, the MMF has done a real good job at a local golf course, and they're building up uh, it into a, more of a resort. And uh, although we don't want to see it explode into a <laughs> large resort, most of the people that are, are here It's always a time, balance, right? Yeah. There's a balance there. And, and the agriculture, the fishery, the um, just the local day-to-day -day services are all getting better and stronger. And uh, we hope it continues in that direction. Well, it's going to be for your reef to answer how that's going to be. Yeah. In the furnace. That's the job of the reef to balance all those things. And he's on later this hour. Jim, thank you very much for being here. Really nice to see you and all the best. Yeah, thank you, Marcy. That's Jim Stevenson. He's a resident of Twin Lake Beach here out in the RM of St. Laurent. We're broadcasting live uh, this morning from the MTT Diner at Petro Canada uh, just off of Highway 6. There are stories you just can't stop thinking about. They take you somewhere. They introduce you to someone. They share something new with you. Lift off. 
Those are the stories you want to share with your friends. And CBC's award-winning documentary team is bringing them to you every week on Storylines. Storylines, new this season on CBC Radio 1 and always on demand on the CBC Listen app. The time right now is 7.20, and we do have that fog advisory in effect. It's the real deal. This morning I was describing uh, the drive up here yesterday, and we were in this pocket. You could not see in front of you. You could not see in the rear view behind you for the fog enveloping everything. If you're out on the highway this morning, be careful. Take care. It could be a little slick as well. This is across southern Manitoba. It includes Winnipeg, Red River Valley, Interlake, White Shell, Pemina Valley, 788-3093 if you want to update traffic and uh please do in the city this morning uh in winnipeg this morning we're expecting a high of three degrees and in st laurent here we're expecting a high of two even right around that zero mark with ice on the windshields well in the news this morning uh, heather will elaborate on this but as she's been reporting the interim leader of manitoba's conservative uh, party says that uh, parents should be informed if their child wants to change their pronouns we got a listener line about it hi there uh, this is Ian newfeld Rue from St. Malo, Manitoba. And I just wanted to call in to say as a parent of two kids, both are non-binary, and as a former youth health educator working in high schools all over Manitoba, I just think it's so important that schools be a safe place for kids to be who they are and be acknowledged and respected for who they are. Because unfortunately, we just can't guarantee that that home is a safe place and that parents are safe people and i would want that for my kids too um and i think that any parent that cares about their kids should want that too thanks a lot take care Thank you for weighing in this morning. Uh, if you want to as well, 788-3205. We'll get calls on on that story throughout the show. And Heather Wells will have that story in the news coming up at 730. It is 723 a.m. right now, and we have morning sports still ahead in this half hour. But uh, we wanted to highlight something else about this area of Manitoba. There is a really rich art scene out here. Uh, Ruby Bruce, local artist, uh, just amazing. She's been on our program before. She just uh, last fall won an Inspire Award. She was honored for the work that she does look her up on instagram surrounded by art this morning on the walls of mtt diner uh, meg hainscock is the artist we're looking at does a lot of uh, whales underwater and beautiful prints and there's also many many musicians that come from this part of manitoba including martin de Jarlet. here's his tune my girl Saturday night, put on a dress, let's go take a ride, gonna get in trouble, gonna treat you right, gonna paint this town tonight, and climb in the cab of my truck, listen to a song by the Red Solar Cup, she said, hey baby, couldn't we hit the road, so I stepped on the gas, hey, let's go, and my girl always down for you, no, know, whatever taking in a good show. Cause she's the one who makes me feel alright Green girl, hey, you are alive Why? I surround the burning like a wildfire Because of mine, I walk the line Cause she's my girl All the time
little music from an artist uh, born and raised here in St. Laurent, Martin Dujarle. That's his tune, My Girl. We are in St. Laurent this morning. Thank you for joining us on a special edition of CBC's Information Radio, 89.3, AM on the app or online. Uh, in Winnipeg, uh, still dealing with that fog advisory, and uh, as mentioned, we're going to head to a high of three, so take it easy if travel is required where you're heading this morning. Still ahead on the show today, f- how five women who grew up with Machif French literally wrote the book on the language. Three are still living here in St. Laurent, and I had the best afternoon with them yesterday. <laughs> you want to hear from them if you want to check out photos. Uh, I popped one up on my Facebook page this morning, so you can see it there, a little preview, and you'll hear our discussion coming up uh, still ahead on the show. Right now, it's time for uh, morning sports. Paul McGowan is in for Scott Regeer once again. Good morning. Good morning, Marcy. So let's start with a high-profile suspension in the world of curling. This is Brienne Harris, the four-time Canadian champion, the lead for Team Kerry Anderson. Uh, and she and her team, of course, were the defending champs at last month's Scotties, which is where just hours before their opening game, Harris was removed from the roster. And that was dramatic enough, but we now know that Harris was removed after testing positive for a banned substance and is now facing a four-year suspension. Now, we heard from Harris yesterday. She believes that she was exposed to the drug in question called Legandrol through bodily contact. And now there is precedence for that argument. Canadian canoeer Laurence Vincent Lapointe tested positive for Legandrol back in 2019. She argued at the time that it was her boyfriend who was taking the substance and the International Canoe Federation accepted that evidence and allowed her to return to competition. So Brianne Harris will be allowed to make her own argument. In the meantime, Curling Canada CEO Nolan Thiessen said yesterday that the timing of the positive test was unfortunate for everyone. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard for everybody. But at the end of the day, the process has to play out. There's lots of times there's out of competition tests that happen in the middle of the summer. And this process would just be playing out. It's just the fact that it happened, you know, it was out of competition, but it was between competition, so to speak, because it was in the middle of our season. So it was a little more apparent and uh, fast moving than at other times. Harris's teammates, by the way, put out a statement saying, quote, we will continue to have Brienne's back through this process. Going to be fascinating to see how this plays out. Let's switch gears. Uh, Canada Soccer is announcing its men's national team roster ahead of a big game next week. A win, yeah, next week, Saturday against Trinidad and Tobago puts Canada through to this summer's Copa America. Uh, That's a tournament involving the top national teams from South America. Now, we know that we're two years out from the World Cup, but the Copa America is seen as valuable international experience ahead of playing those World Cup games on home soil. Uh, And Canada, for this upcoming game, Choosing to go very young with his roster, just one player over the age of 30. Head coach Mauro Biello says that that's intentional and that he's looking for a cultural reset. Definitely want players that are hungry, players that are coming in with that attitude of representing this country. You know, if I had to analyze the squad, it's kind of slipped uh, over the last year. And for me, it's about reigniting that passion and bringing young players that are in form. Uh, These are players that are going to be hungry. These are players that are going to want to be part of this journey. That is the mindset that I want coming into this camp. Now, among that crop of younger players are two who have never appeared for Canada and four more that have capped but never started. We'll see how that group fares down in Texas next Saturday. And finally, Paul, this morning, the uh, PWHL is looking to uh, set yet another record. Yeah, yet another attendance record after the battle on Bay Street last month. That game at Scotiabank Arena in Toronto set the record for attendance at a professional women's hockey game. Now, the league announced yesterday that the April 21st game, again between Montreal and Toronto, has been moved up a day to the 20th and has been moved to the Bell Centre, which can hold roughly 2,000 more fans than Scotiabank Arena. Here's Laura Stacy of PWHL Montreal. It's been crazy. It's at the beginning of the season. It kept being first after first after first history being broken again and again. And honestly, it just keeps getting better and better and better. And it's pretty hard to fathom it. And obviously having the chance to potentially break that record here. And I think um, getting to do it again against Toronto, obviously that rivalry exists. It's growing and uh, awesome to see for this league and for women's hockey in general. Yeah, awesome to see. And uh, speaking of more hockey, the Jets hosting Nashville tonight, a 630 start. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Marcy.
Paul McGowan in for Scott uh, Regeer with Morning Sports. Still ahead, we're going to hear from uh, three of the five authors of a very special book about Machif French. They are from here in St. Laurent, and they were uh, given honorary doctorates for their work. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this interview with these women. Right now, though, your CBC Winnipeg News. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. At 7.30, we've got a little bit of snow grain action out at the airport. It's minus 3 right now in Winnipeg. We do have a fog advisory for Winnipeg. The Pembina and Red River Valleys, as well as the Interlake and eastern Manitoba, including the White Shell. Uh, the fog expected to start to dissipate later this morning, a high in Winnipeg of 3. The RCMP is investigating allegations of hazing involving a rural Manitoba high school hockey team. Two school divisions confirm they are doing an internal investigation. CBC's Karen Pauls reports. I heard that it was a hazing type of incident. Yeah. Mike Watson is the president of the Zone 4 High School Hockey League. He says one of the league's eight teams, the Prairie Mountain Mustangs, withdrew from provincial championships and its players were made ineligible for their league's postseason award awards and all-star game. I agreed. It was the right thing to do. Chad Falk heads the Manitoba High School's Athletic Association, which oversees the league. He hasn't gotten a lot of information from the school divisions, but... It sounds like they are working hard at finding uh, who's in, responsible for this, and I really do hope that uh, justice is, is found for these uh, alleged victims. The team's head coach said he's not at liberty to share any information. Jay Johnson is a kinesiology professor at the University of Manitoba. He's been doing research on hazing in sport for 25 years. Historically, being the whistleblower has rarely worked out well or in favour of the person blowing the whistle. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Manitobans can expect a hike to the minimum wage later this year. The wage will increase 50 cents an hour to $15.80. That starts in October. Labour Minister Malaya Marcelino actually could have permitted another minimum wage increase last year because inflation was high enough. There's a provision for that in the law. But the government passed on that opportunity. Marcelino says the NDP government had other priorities shortly after taking office. After October 18th when I was called to cabinet, um, there wasn't really a lot of time to be able to make those types of decisions, to make the calculations, and then to go through the requisite consultation period. Marcelino adds Manitoba had already raised the minimum wage three times over a year. The wage increase coming in October is based on a legislative formula tying annual increases to inflation. Manitobans from Haiti are worried for the safety of family in that country. Armed gangs have taken over the capital, Port-au-Prince. Gunmen have burned police stations, government buildings, closed the airport, and raided the prison. Haiti's prime minister says he will resign. Marie Pudwell moved from Haiti to Winnipeg in 2008. She says it is unimaginable to see what's happening in Haiti. Every day you wake up, you wake up with, uh, with, with, with scared. You wake up with... You don't know if I go on the street today if I'm going to get back home. You don't know if I go on the street today if I'm going to be able to go back home to sleep. And you don't even, now you're even scared to send your kids to school because they are kidnapping kids even at school. They are kidnapping people at church. Budwell says one of her family members has been kidnapped, uh, kidnapped and extended family can't afford the ransom. The interim leader of Manitoba's Conservative Party believes parents should be informed if their child wants to change their pronouns. Wayne Iwasco wants to ensure parents are involved. Whether it's the topic of pronouns, whether it's other topics within the education world, I don't think it's a bad thing. Why would we want to uh, hide various topics away from parents and guardians? Iwasco was a school teacher and guidance counselor for many years. He says the vast majority of the time, school staff can help students communicate with their parents and alleviate fears about how their parents will react. A Winnipeg doctor is suing after she was injured when a parkade elevator near the Health Sciences Centre suddenly dropped while she was inside. Chow Pham says she suffers chronic pain and psychological trauma after the incident two years ago. In court documents, Pham claims the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, Sherrod Health, and the elevator manufacturer neglected to make sure the elevator was safe. 
Pham had parked on the fourth floor of an Emily Street parkade. She says on the trip down, the elevator dropped and she fell forward. She says the elevator then stopped suddenly, causing serious injuries to her spinal cord and legs. Pham now has permanent disabilities and is suing for lost income and damages. Well, a close colleague of deceased Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny is accusing President Vladimir Putin for an attack outside his home in Lithuania. Leonid Volkov says he was sprayed with tear gas and repeatedly hit with a hammer. Volkov describes it as a characteristic bandit hello from Putin's henchmen. Just hours before the attack, he had given an interview speaking of the dangers facing the president's opponents. Our work is full of very complicated challenges, of enormous pressure, of high individual risks. Because we know that Putin does not only kill people inside Russia, he also kills people outside Russia. In a video posted online, Volkov vows never to give up on his work. You can hear the latest national and international news coming up on World Report at 8 and find more Manitoba news at cbc.ca slash Manitoba. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Well, we're getting calls actually about the news this morning, specifically about the story that Heather just uh, delivered around the interim leader of Manitoba's Conservative Party saying he believes parents should be informed if their child wants to change their pronouns. Here's a call. Hi, this is uh, Helen calling from southern Manitoba, and I'm a grandparent of six children going to school. And I do believe that parents need to be notified of their children's expressing uh, the desire to have a gender change or change their pronoun. All adolescents experience puberty, handle it very differently. If this gender issue is introduced at this somewhat vulnerable time of development, it can very easily become a mental health issue. And it can lead, that can lead to all manner of concerns for this child. Let's remember they are children we are talking with and about. And the care is for the parents to be responsible for them. And 99% of parents will do this in a great way and even get help if they need it. Thank you for bringing this up to us. Uh, so we are asking for uh, your perspective on uh, on this news, and you can weigh in at 788-3205. Thank you for the calls that are coming in this morning. It is 7.37 a.m. You're on 89.3 FM, 9.90 a.m. on the app or online with us this morning. Sure is icy out in St. Laurent, our special program this morning, and uh, yeah, we're affected out here by the fog as well. Back in Winnipeg, though, uh, here's Abby Adeyemi with a full look at our forecast and also some details on that big fog advisory. Abby. Good morning, once again. Again, I know you're close to the lakes and you'll be seeing lots of fog in that area. Yes, we have that dense fog advisory in effect for southern Manitoba and various regions across the province, which includes Winnipeg, the Red River and Pemina Valleys, the Interlake, eastern Manitoba and the White Shell areas. Now, these affected areas are experiencing near zero visibility due to thick fog and this can make uh, travel very, very tricky for a lot of people. So if you're on the road, take caution and remember to slow down just keep an eye out for other vehicles and be prepared to stop if your visibility is hampered if we check out what the condition looks like in brandon it's chilly at uh, zero and with light rain heading to thompson it's currently minus nine mostly cloudy we'll see a high of uh, minus five there today further north in churchill it is minus 11 and cloudy with light snow uh, Dauphin is at minus 2 and cloudy. Uh, Gimli is at minus 1 and cloudy. Also, the Interlake region will be seeing mainly cloudy conditions today. Also, a risk of freezing drizzle this morning. And then the fog patches will be dissipating later in the morning. Steinbeck is at minus 3. Also, cloudy there. Morris is at minus... It's at, currently at 1, actually, and cloudy. The Pemna Valley region is anticipating cloudy conditions all through the day and a chance of uh, light rain this morning. And then a mix of sun and later also a freeze of... A risk of that freezing rain might develop with uh, fog patches uh, dis dissipating this morning. But in Winnipeg, we are at uh, minus three and heading to a high of three degrees. All right. Thanks very much, Abby. You're welcome. Well, in traffic, Corey, I have to say I, I have been to this area of Manitoba before, but I never noticed the uh, signs. Uh, yesterday when we were driving yeah. around, there were signs that said Bombardier Crossing. Yeah. And if you're <laughs> trying to picture a Bombardier, it's, it's like um, it's like a 
big it's an old school snowmobile, snowmobile machine, huh? covered yeah. it, like it's a, it's a nice warm snowmobile well, we're gonna have <laughs> uh, a story about that emily brass uh, part yeah. of cunies and focus in the weeks ahead but i just as far as traffic signs i, I don't remember no. those and then you see them around town people's yeah. driveways it's yeah. cool uh for what we could see we were affected by that fog yesterday here we couldn't even see the lake mm-hmm. we took a drive uh this morning what are you hearing on the traffic line yeah really so of course that fog is the biggest issue we just heard from abby about it's fact impacting the interlake uh winnipeg southern manitoba in general uh also got a call from thomas if you're driving around the russell area in western manitoba highway 16 highway 41 pretty slippery right now because of freezing rain uh so to heads up if you're hitting the highway there might be a bit slippery for you uh, other than that things seem to be going fairly smooth haven't heard of any issues in the city if you're walking biking driving give me a call let me know what you're seeing out there and i'll let folks uh know that number to call 204-788-3093 all right thanks very much Corey. well next on our live show from saint laurent a labor of love for their language how five women from this community put their pens to paper to preserve michif french words history and recipes McDonald's. The highway was good for when you came. The highway was good, but the the bram en masse. Moi, j'étais pas pari comme m'amener oh, chercher. Ah, gars, les gens mais pari quand tu vas le ramasser. Ben, là, j'arrange <laughs> mes cheveux puis. Et je le téléphonais à 8 heures. À 8 heures, matin, je le téléphonais. Pour oh, dire ton. Pour dire mon venant. Oui. Are you guys talking about doing your hair this morning? Yeah. Oh, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> that is June Bruce, Agat Chartrand, and Lorraine Couture, and they are talking uh, in Michif French. Uh, one of the things they did is put it together a, uh, a book, a very, very special book, and it does include uh, words and history and recipes, but I want you to hear some of the language there. They are the three living authors left of a little book called Machif French, as spoken by most Machif people of St. Laurent. I visited with them yesterday in a bright sunroom surrounded by windows and a warm fireplace just off the main highway number six here, and they were sitting shoulder to shoulder to shoulder in their beaded moccasins, one with a turtle beaded pin, another with Métis earrings and an infinity symbol Métis tattoo on her forearm. And they shared with me why what they publish in 80 pages just might save a dialect of French for future generations. And as you'll hear, these women mean business. Can you tell me what is on your shirt? Straight out of Saint Laurent. <laughs> you guys have got like the straight out of Compton shirts, but straight out of Saint Laurent. I love that. Born and raised here, June. Born and raised here. Born and raised right, n- right here. Like you're pointing out the window, literally yeah, across the road, next to the fish shed. I got. Yeah. And how old are you, ladies? Now I know it's a rude question, but it's going to play into us talking about some history of language. I'm 84. I'll be 78 tomorrow, and I'll be 77 in June. Have you guys known each other for a long time? All our lives, yeah. all our lives. Now, we're here to talk about language. I've always been Michif, like from day one when we were born. We didn't know we were different. We always talk Michif French. We didn't know the difference between other languages. I mean, we thought everybody was the same. So when did you hear other kinds of French? At school, it was um, the nuns from Quebec. And we, uh, we have to learn t- their language or else we were sent in the back of the class. When the nuns came in uh, speaking French and they wanted all, all of us to speak the French, French French like they spoke, French. yeah, the Quebec French, we didn't know the, there was a difference. Like uh, our Michif French, we spoke it all our lives, but it was never ever written down. It was all oral. Yeah, we wrote it down. We were the first ones to write it down, this book. What you're holding is a book that says Machif French, as spoken by most Machif people in Saint Laurent. And you three women are three of the authors of this book. There were, were five. There were five. Two have passed away. Two passed away. Patsy yeah. Miller and uh, Doris Mikulienko. Yeah. They passed away. So how did this happen? How did you get together and say, we're going to be the ones to write this down? Well, we went to a meeting in uh, Winnipeg at the Manitoba Métis Federation, and uh, it was supposed to be a, a Michif language. And then we got there, and there was a whole room of people. And they were laughing and talking and like crazy. Like, you know, we didn't understand a word they were saying, but they were uh, talking in Michif Cree. And I said that we said to ourselves, that's not how we speak in Saint Laurent. So when we came back home, we decided, we sat together and we said, well, 
we're going to write our own. That's when we started, 2011. How long did it take you to get this put together? Five years. Yeah, yeah every Tuesday. We met here in St. Arendt at uh, MMF. They gave us a room there. Why did you think it was important to do a GAT? Why did you want to be part of it? The language was dying down, so we have to do something, I guess. You know, we're, we're just like five sisters. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. It was very important because I w the, our language was dying down, and all the young kids, they all spoke English. Like, we're really it's just our generation. All the elders that spoke uh, much of French, mm -hmm. and... We wanted it to, for the kids to learn in school, which they do today. Yeah. We just didn't want the language to be forgotten. It's pretty amazing that you took that initiative. Yeah, there are yeah. some words in our uh, language in Mitchell French that we use as uh, Cree words, like, uh, I don't know, a, sh a shikok, a skunk, but that's a, a Cree word. We didn't know that. I thought that was uh, the proper word for uh, a skunk. And until I went to some place uh, where they speak good French, and they said, they start laughing. He said, we call that a moufette. Mm -hmm. So I never heard that word before. <laughs> a moufette and bête piante. Yeah. But so we have a few Cree words in our language. Um, is Michif French uh, unique to this area? Or will you, where else will you hear it in Canada? Or where else in Manitoba? St. Eustache mm -hmm. and St. Laurent. Is it outside of Manitoba anywhere, do you know? Yes, it is uh, on... At the end of this month, we're going to Saskatoon for a workshop uh, from St. Louis, St. Yeah. Louis, Saskatchewan. They speak like us, like the Michif French. A lot of the people, when they had to move away from Saint Laurent, um, in the days when they had to, you know, disperse the people, a lot of people went to Saskatchewan. When a lot of people went to, so they took the language from here to other places on the prairies. Mm -hmm. Yes, they did. How do you feel when you speak it? Feel good, especially if uh, you, who, whoever you're talking to understands you, mm -hmm. and they s speak back to you in Michif. Yeah. How do you feel when you speak it? I'm, I'm happy when they, I hear them talking my language. When we spoke Michif French at school, the nuns got mad at us, and they, they used to tell us, you speak like little Indians. Mm -hmm. They told us every time we said something in Michif French. Where were you going to school? Right here, Simon at school. Like up the road from yeah. highway, we're right, just right off the there. highway. Right over there, there's a fish shed, a blue fish shed there. Yeah. And that's where the school used to be. You must be awfully proud that you did this. Yeah. Very, very proud. We're on our second book. Okay, yeah. where is that? What are you working on now? Yeah, Breaking news. <laughs> we're just making another book. It's not a dictionary, it's stories. We're writing that all down and... Uh, through a cultural lens, the customs yeah. and the cultures yeah. through a Michif French lens. Yeah, yeah. Lens. yeah. We're, we, I think we have five chapters and it'll be in English and Michif. It's going to be with pictures too, so our own, our pictures. own pictures. What do you hope the future is for Michif French and for your culture? Well, I hope they're taught in all the schools out here. Even in Winnipeg, they're starting to teach them in schools. My grandkids and my great-grandkids, I hope they all speak it. How about you? What do you hope the future holds a gap for Michif French and for your culture? Uh, for the kids, my niece and nephew, while they come at my place, I talk to them Michif, and sometimes they don't understand, but when I get mad, they understand. <laughs> You get in trouble in Michif French. Yeah. I've loved meeting you and spending some time with all of you. Thank you so very much yeah. for sharing more your culture welcome, and your language. More than Thank welcome, you. more than welcome. Oh, you're welcome, Ben. Bye-bye. June Bruce, the Gat Chartrand, and Lorraine Couture. Their book is Michif French, as spoken by most Michif people of St. Laurent. It was published in 2016, and they received honorary doctorates from the University of Winnipeg for their work in, uh, to preserve the language. We'll wait for their next book. People are already writing in on Facebook about this. Uh, Becky Letts says, I love hearing Michif French. It's a fun challenge for me to pick out what I can understand based on my knowledge of French. I'm so glad to hear about the language being preserved.
It is 11 minutes to 8 o'clock on 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or online this morning. I'm Marcy Marcusa with our team here. Uh, we're live in community and out of town, about 70K uh, northwest of Winnipeg, around Lake uh, Manitoba this morning in St. Laurent, Manitoba. Now, if you drive into St. Laurent, the first thing that you might notice, because, you know, you drive into other places... Uh, is that there isn't really a central Main Street. Uh, This community was settled by the lake allotments, and so the houses are spread out in a line for many kilometers in a row. It's also home to many beaches, including Twin Lakes beaches, Laurentia, Sandpiper. But if you drive out to the water, you're also going to pass by horses and farmer's fields and signs, as we said, that say Bombardier Crossing and lawns with colorful folk art. This is classic big sky Prairie, Manitoba, and the reeve of the arm of St. Laurent is Rick Chartrand and uh, at MTT Diner with us this morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Thanks for having us in your neck of the woods. Welcome. What, uh, what do you love best about being a leader in this part of the province? I love the challenges. I love uh, the fact that since we've been in council that we're making changes for the community and we're noticing the changes the people are starting to become more and more involved in the community they're volunteering more and that to me is proof that what we're doing is is positive tell me about uh, when you when you say a fairly fairly new i know that you're fairly new in your position also some a fairly new cao and counselors tell me what that vision is that you guys have that you're that you're telling community you know come on board with us that that you believe is working one of the things that we all decided, and uh, the four councillors and myself were all newly elected, one of the things we wanted to do was to make Saint Laurent uh, more visible to the people in Manitoba. You know, to put us on the map, to show what we do have to offer, um, to offer the beaches, to offer the many different things that are in the process. Um, What's in the works right now that you're excited about? Well. We're really involved with the MMF, and one of the things the MMF have just done is they opened up their daycare, which was a 45-space um, daycare. They're also in the works of doing a golf course. The golf course is up and running. Hopefully by April, they'll have the clubhouse, the restaurant will be running. They're also developing approximately 80 um, sites for camping and RVing. And so, you've got such a diversity of population here. Um, how do you unite populations? I mean, in Saint Laurent, there's 1,500 people year-round, about I think is the number, and this proud, rich Métis history here, the largest population in North America. I've been seeing infinity symbols on flags flying in front of the houses as we've been driving around. But then you also have, of course, the huge cottage population. How much does it swell in the summer? Oh, it doubles, if not more, in uh, in size. Uh, Twin Lakes, there's a huge amount of people that show up there. Laurentia Beach, Johnson Beach, Pioneer Beach. Uh, just down the road, maybe two kilometers away, there's a Portuguese park that has approximately 400 campers. And Is it called that because a lot of the folks that are there are Portuguese descent? They're all Portuguese. Yeah. They all come from Winnipeg and... Uh, during their festivals, they'll swell up to a thousand people as well. So, how do you, as Reeve, see you know manage that, especially because the permanent population year-round <laughs> is eclipsed by the numbers? So you've got fifteen hundred Saint Laurent, and then I think it grows to over four thousand, as you said. Mm-hmm. Um, is that difficult? Because the future could be all recreation all the time, but as people that are here year-round are you know would have different needs. How do you manage that? One of the things that we do is we go out and we visit with these people just to make ourselves known who we are and uh, that's one of the things I'm proud to say about our counselors as well they go out and different events or what have you they'll show up and uh, just let them know who they are if there's any concerns that they have they bring it forward to us and we discuss it so you make sure you're really connected with that and you're talking about with the population that is here year-round correct yeah it's interesting because i was talking to a couple of the gentlemen in the cafe there's probably 20 people here this morning now uh they've been coming and going but a lot of people were born and raised here that's right yeah there's how much uh, how important is pride to this area of manitoba that people really connect with being from here if you're metis you're very proud and uh as you had mentioned, the 
population here uh, year round is probably 80 percent uh, Métis and one of the things they've mentioned is they want to bring that pride back into the community and one of the things we had was what was called Métis Days mm -hmm. and that went away because of COVID what have you but uh, last year they approached us and we helped them bring it up one day this year they're going to do it again for three days in a row and in the winter time there used to be a, a, a winter festival it was called Manapogo which is the the monster that's on Lake Manitoba and so there used to be Manapogo days and so these are all things that we want to do we want to bring it back and it, it benefits the local residents but it also brings it out to the people that do visit that we have a lot to offer um, you were saying to me off air, I was drawing the picture of sort of the allotments on the lake and how this area was settled and that you don't have sort of a central main street. Um, do you hear about that all the time? <laughs> oh, yes. There's people that'll say, um, where's downtown St. Laurent? And I go, if you go past what used to be called Grattan's General Store and you blink, you've missed us. <laughs> Is that challenging, the fact that the uh, houses and residences are sort of spread out in that linear way? It is, but the, the other thing that um, has to be brought forward is that St. Laurent is not just one town. Uh, further up the road, you have Oak Point, which is part of the RM. And at one time, many years ago, if you went out east towards the Shoal Lakes, there were little communities. One was Harperville, one was Ideal. People still live in those areas, and you have to make sure that when... Um, we're working as a municipality that all these communities are involved. You're including. Right. Lots of including. Um, you mentioned right off the top that uh, you're reaching out to people, you're seeing people starting to volunteer. Is the need for volunteers great? Like in what areas are, are you needing those volunteers? One of the things we need volunteers for is the fire department. Um, it was neglected for a while. For eight years, they hadn't had a raise. And when we came on as council, one of the things we did was we said, we need to pay these people because they're putting their lives on the line when they go to a vehicle collision or for a fire. So that's one of the areas in volunteerism yes. that was a need. I know we're going to have a story on that uh, in the weeks ahead. Uh, Communities in Focus means that our morning show is here live, but all week long we have producers and our reporter Emily Brass here in community sharing many stories. Uh, Reeve Chartrand, thank you for having us in your community. Oh, thank you. Uh, Reeve, Rick Chartrand of the Arm of St. Laurent. And uh, we are here this morning at MTT Diner. He's been with us live and uh, you can be as well if you want to drop by. Just off Highway 6 and uh, this is uh, in the back of the Petrocan Station here. The restaurant back here surrounded by wood, nice pitch ceiling, enjoy a warm coffee with us. Uh, that is if you can safely drive. We do have issues with fog this morning. We'll get to that in a moment. Right now though, let's go to Heather Wells with our news headlines. Good morning. Well, the person in charge of Manitoba High School Sports hopes just Justice can be found for the victim or victims of an alleged incident of hazing in hockey. RCMP and two school divisions are investigating the Prairie Mountain Mustangs. That team draws players from several rural high schools. We'll hear more. And the interim leader of Manitoba's Conservative Party believes parents should be informed if their child wants to change their pronouns. Wayne Iwasku wants to ensure parents are involved. We'll hear from Wayne Iwasku as well in our next local news at 8.30. All right. Thank you very much, Heather. Well, we're getting a lot of listener lines on that story about uh, about schools and uh, Owasco and, and his comments. So we're going to hear more of uh, your opinions and thoughts on the story coming up on Information Radio. Also, as our broadcast continues from St. Laurent this morning, I mentioned Emily Brass. She's here all week. She's sharing many, many stories as communities in focus uh, is, uh, in this area of Manitoba. Today, she's going to take us uh, to a basketball game with special linguistic significance. So we're going to hear what that is all about after eight o'clock watch that fog we got an advisory it's affecting all of southern manitoba including winnipeg red river valley interlake white shell and pemina valley 7883093 call us if you need Hey, on Q with Tom Power. Diana Lee Inosanto grew up in a unique household. Her dad was a legendary martial arts trainer. Her godfather was Bruce Lee. Diana will talk about getting her big break as an actor in her 50s. I have the gift of gratitude on such a profound level. And what you might not know about being a stuntwoman. 
That's coming up on Q, followed by Commotion with Elamine Abdel Mahmoud on CBC Radio 1, CBC Listen app, and everywhere you get your podcast. The CBC News is next. Coming up in half an hour, it's The Current with Matt Galloway. It has been called the miracle drug by celebrities looking to lose weight, but the diabetes medication Ozempic has origins closer to Canada. Coming up on The Current, the Canadian doctor whose research helped pave the way for Ozempic. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. Officials across Canada are preparing for another extreme wildfire season. How it all plays out depends on what kind of weather we get in the next few weeks. Scientists are also poring over the data from last summer. It was the worst wildfire season on record. And as Ben Shingler reports, experts are looking for lessons to get ready for another tinder dry summer. Record-breaking is almost a euphemism. Marc Parisien has spent the past few months taking stock of the 2023 wildfire season. He's a research scientist at Natural Resources Canada and one of the authors of a new study. A lot of what happened last year challenged what we thought we understood about wildland fire. There weren't more fires compared to other years, but the average size was far larger. Roughly 15 million hectares burned across Canada, more than seven times the average. The study says early snowmelt and drought conditions in western Canada and sudden dry weather in the east are to blame. Warmer, drier conditions are leading to uh, much bigger fires, more intense fires. Katrina Moser is an associate professor in geography and environment at Western University. She says much of Canada is already on alert for this season. We are unfortunately seeing very similar conditions uh, coming into the spring. So very warm uh, temperatures again. Uh, low snow cover uh, again right across Canada. Quebec issued a warning for parts of the province last week. And in Alberta, B.C. and the Northwest Territories, some fires from last year were never fully extinguished. Experts say whether Canada is in store for another big wildfire season depends on the weather in the weeks to come. But as the climate changes, the country will need to be ready for more in the years ahead. Ben Shingler, CBC News, Montreal. Lithuania's president has a message for Vladimir Putin. No one is afraid of you here. These comments come as a police investigation in Lithuania begins into an attack on one of Alexei Navalny's close colleagues. Leonid Volkov was a longtime aide to the deceased Russian opposition leader. Volkov was reportedly sprayed by tear gas and hit with a hammer yesterday in Vilnius. He survived, and just hours before the attack... He gave an interview where he spoke about the dangers of opposing Russia's president. Our work is full of very complicated challenges, of enormous pressure, of high individual risks. Because we know that Putin does not only kill people inside Russia, he also kills people outside Russia. Volkov has been released from hospital. In a video posted online, he promises he will never give up on his work. Joe Biden will once again face Donald Trump in the upcoming U.S. presidential election. Each candidate secured enough delegates to become their party's nominee in yesterday's primaries. The CBC's Richard Madden joins me now from Washington. And Richard, no surprises there last night, but break down what this all means as we head towards the November vote. Yeah, it's like the start of a movie sequel. Everyone knows the plot, the main characters, but we just don't know how it ends yet. With their nominations clinched, polling suggests it will be another tight race between Joe Biden and Donald Trump that will once again come down to key swing states. Now, last night, both candidates released videos after their win, hoping to shape the ballot box issue. So for 81-year-old Joe Biden, it's a story about an American comeback post-pandemic, but he warned what's at stake if voters choose the alternative. Are you ready to defend democracy? Are you ready to protect our freedom? Now, Donald Trump's video slammed Biden's handling of the economy, and he promised a sweeping immigration crackdown with record deportations. Now we have to get back to work because we have the worst president in the history of our country. His name is Joe Biden. Now, both nominations will be made official at party conventions this summer, giving Americans their first presidential rematch in 70 years. There are still individual candidates in this presidential race. What can you tell us about them and how they could affect the vote? 
Yeah, that could be a factor, especially with two candidates who are generally unpopular with voters looking for an alternative. You've got the Green Party, no labels, Robert Kennedy Jr., and other independents fighting for a spot on the ballot. Now, a third party could tip the scales, especially in those key swing states where the margins of victory have been so slim. Think Al Gore in 2000, Hillary Clinton in 2016. Now, the chances of a third party winning an election is very slim, but if a candidate swings enough states in key states from either Biden or Trump, they could ultimately decide who won the election. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. The CBC's Richard Madden in Washington. There is a rush for power happening right now in Haiti. Politicians are vying for a place on the transitional council that will replace Prime Minister Ariel Henry. But the gangs that forced him out are also demanding a seat at the table. And while that plays out, the capital is facing lawlessness, violence and dwindling health care. Etienne Côté-Paluc is editor-in-chief of Haiti Weekly. We reached him in Port-au-Prince. Etienne, what is the situation on the ground this morning? This morning, the situation is pretty calm. We had a curfew again last night, but still everybody's really waiting to see what will be the reaction from the the violent uh, criminal groups that took over the streets for the last 10 days. Right now, the situation is pretty difficult for everybody because we're all in our houses waiting to see how it's going to happen, trying not to take the street too much. All the schools are closed. The good news is that yesterday, they announced that the commercial port was reopened. The commercial port was closed by the the gangs themselves last week, and we thought that might stay like that for a while. Now we see that it's coming back in function, and there was some gas in gas stations. So for now, uh, we're taking the good news where it is. What have you heard about the process to bring in a governing council to replace Ariel Henry? There's big political discussion happening right now for the last few days about that uh, presidential commission. Uh, some people are, are for it, some people are against, but now we're, the, the political discussion is around who's going to be part of it. Uh, it's a coalition of seven people from different political parties and associations. They have to not have been arrested already or have any accusations against them. So it's two big criteria that would take them out from the start out of the negotiation. And that's why some of them are calling for protests today. But we're not expecting big protests because of the situation. Thank you, Etienne. My pleasure. Etienne Côté-Paluc with Haiti Weekly in Port-au-Prince. Four U.S. Army vessels are now en route to the eastern Mediterranean. They are carrying about 100 soldiers who will build a temporary port on Gaza's coast. It is all designed to help more aid get into the Palestinian territory. Here is U.S. Army Brigadier General Brad Hinson. Once we get uh, fully mission capable, <clears throat> we will be able to push up to uh, 2 million meals or 2 million bottles of water ashore each day. So The U.N. says it has been difficult to get food and supplies into the northern part of the Gaza Strip. Henson says the offshore platform and pier should be up and running in 60 days. Italy's right-wing government is planning to pass a new law and order bill. It would usher in an unprecedented crackdown on prisoners. As Megan Williams tells us, the proposed law comes at a time when prisoner suicides in Italy are at an all-time high. A gate shuts close in Milan's main San Vittore prison, a rundown penitentiary built 150 years ago. That is Italy's most crowded, holding two and a half times the number of prisoners it was designed for. Due to overcrowding and worsening conditions, the rate of self-harm and suicide here and in other prisons is soaring, say experts. And they say a proposed new law by Italy's government, headed by the far right Giorgia Meloni, would make things worse. This is an erosion of the rule of law and a constitutional setback, says prisoner rights advocate Patrizio Gonella. In the new law, prisoners who beat on their cell bars or refuse to work or eat could be punished. Legal experts and prison workers say the law would exacerbate the growing problems of overcrowding and understaffing and make it harder for inmates to access health, psychiatric and educational services. 
Criminal lawyer Valentina Alberta says the proposed law is the most severe in Europe, where overcrowding is also rife. That nothing like that is uh, in other countries, and I don't think that uh, the European Court of Human Rights is going to accept a bill like that. Since coming to power in late 2022, Maloney's government has cracked down on everyone, from rave organizers and climate protesters to parents who let their kids skip school. Megan Williams, CBC News, Rome. And that is the latest national and international news from World Report News Anytime at cbcnews.ca. I'm Marcia Young. Hi, my name is Sandra. Oh, I've lived here for so long. I love it. I could never live in the city or anywhere else because it's quiet and you have a lot of wildlife, nature, lots of things to do, gardening. Oh, you're listening to Information Radio, live from St. Laurent MPT Service. <laughs> well said. I love all the laughter here. I also love hearing from the folks uh, who live in St. Laurent. Many of them are born and raised. Others come here for the lakes and grow the community in the summer months. It's a really interesting population. I'm Marcy Marcusa with, with our team. This is Communities in Focus. We're live at MTT Diner at the Petro Canada just off Highway 6. And we are featuring the stories of St. Laurent this morning and all week long and in the weeks ahead. So this half hour on the show, we're going to be uh, building on our story about language. In the last hour, we heard about Machif French and those women from St. Laurent that both wrote the book on it, literally. This half hour, we're going to look to future generations and take you to an unusual setting to hear how language is uh, being celebrated and preserved. A basketball court? CBC's Emily Brassa will have that story for us live from here at MTT Diner. Also, we're going to build on a story that's in the news. So first, let's go to news headlines with Heather Walls. Good morning. Well, after missing an opportunity to boost pay last year, Manitoba will hike minimum wage to $15.80 an hour in October. The Labour Minister says back in 2023, the new government lacked time to study and consult on the wage increase. A Winnipeg doctor is suing after she was injured when a parkade elevator near the Health Sciences Centre suddenly dropped while she was inside. Chow Pham says she suffers chronic pain and psychological trauma after that incident two years ago. We'll hear more about what she alleges coming up in our next local news at 8.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Let's get into the weather forecast. So, Abby Adeyemi, I'm going to look out the front window of MTT here, and I'm going to tell you that it uh, it looks like really cloudy, like you're sitting in the middle of a cloud. Uh, it's foggy. Now, we are by the lakes here, so you're right that you get more fog when you're in those areas. But the highways have just been really, really crazy. I hope people are taking caution this morning. What's it like out your studio window in Winnipeg? Yes, uh, looking outside, the sea, uh, okay, I'm just going to do that for the folks on YouTube. Uh, it looks like it's clearing in the downtown but I've been getting reports from uh, the highway and that it's still a bit foggy there that dense fog is affecting a much part, uh, a lot of areas outside of the city and it's affecting most uh, part of southern Manitoba which includes Winnipeg and of course the Red River Valley the Pamela Valley the Interlake Eastern Manitoba the White Shell this affected areas are experiencing near zero visibility due to the thick fog and this can make uh, driving uh, something tricky so you need to uh, be careful on the roads and take caution. Remember to slow down, keep an eye out for other vehicles and be prepared to stop if uh, your visibility is hampered. Just expect the fog to lift around midday today, though in the downtown part of the city, we see that it's clearing up. The forecast in Winnipeg for today is going to be mostly cloudy and we do have that risk of freezing, drizzle and fog patches that will be coming and going. The high for today is expected to be at uh, 3 degrees, but right now now we are at minus three. All right. Thanks very much, Abby. You're welcome. So we'll see where the day goes with this fog. But yeah, for the morning drive this morning, it's not just that. It's also a bit icy out there. There was ice on my windshield. Uh, Corey is getting calls forwarded from Winnipeg. So he's hearing around the province what's happening with traffic. But what do you understand now about it? Yeah, speaking of that ice, there's been some freezing rain in western Manitoba this morning. Heard from Thomas <clears throat> that around Russell, Manitoba, uh, the Highway 16, Highway 41, uh, pretty slippery right now because of that freezing rain. Also, uh, Sue Ann called around Minnedosa. Same thing, a little bit uh, uh, slippery as well because of some freezing rain. Uh, in Winnipeg, southeast perimeter got a call on the commuter line that there is that fog, but it's still pretty drivable. It's not like super duper thick in front of your face, but uh, just be careful if you are 
uh, driving down that southeast perimeter uh, as well. But if you see something else going on out there uh, or don't see something going on out there because it's super foggy, give me a call on the CBC commuter line. I'll let folks know uh, what you're seeing. There is also one other thing to keep uh, to remind folks of as well. Uh, the uh, DSFM, the French school division, we got an email from them just letting parents know. They just want to let parents know that because of that fog and that visibility, there is actually uh, the expecting delays for school transportation this morning. So just letting parents know uh, about show director we just had a little bit of a connection issue with our folks in saint laurent so now we're going to play a song by eddie fury here you go lost inside Listening to Eric Flurry. Apologies for a bit of our tech difficulty there, but good save, Studio 15 in Winnipeg. Uh, in particular, because Eric Flurry is known as the Metis Johnny Cash. He wrote to us, he's from St. Laurent, Manitoba. So he's a homegrown artist here, and he wrote this tune for his mom. So we wanted to share it with you this morning. We are broadcasting live from St. Laurent this morning on 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or online. So thank you so much for tuning in. Well, let's get back to the stories from this part of Manitoba. As we've been hearing on the show this morning, St. Laurent has a rich linguistic history, but sometimes that diversity has led the community to the community being divided, divided by language. Some community members say they've been working on building bridges through sports. Joining us with more is CBC's Emily Brass. She is here with us in the dining room live at MTT on Highway 6. Good morning. Good morning, Marcy. So you've been in this area in St. Laurent since Monday. I know you've been gathering and talking to all kinds <laughs> of people, um, also talking to people about the languages spoken here. What have some of those conversations, um, where rather, have some of those conversations been taking place for you? Well, you're right. I've been talking to so many people. I counted last night and realized I've already interviewed 16 people here in St. Laurent this week, and it's only Wednesday. I'm going to be here until Friday 
Friday. So I had a lot of chats about languages at the two local schools, St. Lawrence School and École Communitaire Aurel Le Moine. And that's where a lot of people might pronounce the town's name more like Saint Laurent. And that's where I met Principal Melanie Sparks. In fact, she's joining us this morning in the dining room. Hi, Melanie. She grew up speaking Michif French in St. Eustache. That's another Métis community here in Manitoba. And Sparks left Canada and lived in Europe for a while. And when she came back 12 years ago, she decided to settle down with her family in St. Laurent. And Sparks expected to fit in really quickly, but found out it could be a bit hard at first to get to know people. When I moved to St. Laurent, I realized that I was part of the lake people. And so I felt um, that I wasn't able to necessarily connect with my Métis heritage. Um, the pe everybody seemed to have been grouped in certain ways in St. Laurent. And so um, we have the people from the lake, the cottagers. And then we also, also have uh, the Métis, but there's the Francophone Métis and the English Métis. And then we had people who belonged to the different schools. And so the community seemed very divided. And um, I really do love being with people. And I love being with all kinds of people. It doesn't matter to me who you are. But I, don't, I wanted to bridge those differences. And I really um, decided that that was going to be something that I embarked on um, as a citizen here, but also as an employee of wherever I worked. So Sparks started in her role as an educational leader to reach out across those lines. She says she worked with staff and parent volunteers to try to make everyone in the community feel welcome at the French school. Sparks says some of that welcoming was also making sure people felt comfortable speaking their own language with their own accent. And she thinks the fact the school's student body has grown 40% over the last six years shows that approach is working. Sparks says she's even seen people who once told her, oh, they don't speak French or midshift start to open up and speak those languages and a lot of people in St. Laurent lost their connection to their ancestors language through schools in the past when Métis students were often told they spoke bad French but Spark says nowadays you'll hear all kinds of accents and languages and dialects in the school hallway. Uh, it's so interesting I mean and well put you know to, to really get into that diversity of all the different populations and, and dialects. Now right across the street I'm gonna try to do this correctly is St. Laurent uh, school. Uh, so you also spent time there this week and also spoke with someone else who's uh, been working on building bridges. Yes, and that's at St. Lawrence School. Oh, see, I knew I'd mix it up. <laughs> it's hard to keep the, you know, everyone says both ways and, and even in the same sentence sometimes. So I might be doing the same thing here this morning. And yes, uh, that's where I met Crystal miller Corshane, and she's the Indigenous Academic Achievement Lead for Prairie Rose School Division, but she used to be the principal at St. Lawrence School. And way before that, miller Corshane was captain of the basketball basketball team at St. Lawrence School when she was in grade 12. Now both of those schools are small and don't necessarily have enough students to put together sports teams and that was the case a few years ago with basketball. But she and Melanie Sparks, the principal across the road, came up with a plan to join forces and make a co-op team with students from both schools. So it was really important for me to keep that basketball program striving here in St. Lawrence and then I thought it would be really nice just to have everybody included you know, because they're also from this community and if they can't have a team, it would be nice to have them join our team. Um, so I inquired into it and talked to Melanie and we decided to co-op and so, yeah, it did bring our kids together um, and they're doing really, really well. I love that. How well are they doing though? Well, for the second year in a row, the team is going to the provincials. They leave tomorrow for the championship games in Glenboro, Manitoba. And the two biggest stars of the team are 12th graders, Tyson Christensen and Tyrell Jolicar. One of them goes to school in English, the other in French, and both players say coming together has made them a really strong team. I caught up to them, uh, with them rather, at the basketball practice. There was always like a rivalry, kind of like, who's better and like that, but I think it's getting better. We're getting close. Even though we go to different schools, I still think we're very close and good friends with each other. We just hanging out other other places, like my friend's house and stuff like that. How does Principal Sparks feel? I mean, I mean, hearing from the students is the, is a real proof, right, that her dream of bridging the two schools is becoming a reality through basketball. Well, I noticed when I started talking to her about the team going to the provincial, she immediately started smiling, and her face lights up with pride. And we're really excited for them. We've got a really strong team, and uh, I don't think that would have been possible if we hadn't worked together. 
Sparks told me she believes that spirit of cooperation the students have developed playing basketball together will last into the future when the teenagers grow up and continue living together in St. Laurent or Saint Laurent, however you say it. Emily, I thank you very much, and I know that you have the pleasure of being here all week, collecting all kinds of stories for Communities in Focus. Um, so if people want to reach out to Emily, you can do that through the show, or uh, we'll uh, pass along information for how you can get your stories to her. But uh, thank you for making time on the morning show today. Well, this was so much fun. Thank you, Marcy. Emily Brass, reporter at CBC Manitoba. So if you want to reach us with a story idea, radio893 at cbc.ca, and we will pass it along. She's going to be here in St. Laurent. St. Laurent, gathering stories through Friday. Brady Keeper and Bridget Laquette both played here. What future star will you see this year? The Manitoba Indigenous Cultural Education Centre Annual Indigenous Minor Hockey Tournament is back March 22nd to 24th at the Hockey for All Centre. The best Indigenous minor hockey players in Manitoba come together in competition and CBC is a proud sponsor. Visit cbc.ca slash manitoba slash community for more. Right now, the time is at 8.25 a.m. I'm Marcy Marcusa. You're listening to Information Radio on 89.3 FM, 9.90 a.m. on the app. And on YouTube, you might be seeing our Studio 15 folks. We are live in St. Laurent, and uh, this morning we're at the MTT Diner, as we've been mentioning, in the Petrocan, just off Highway 6 here. And uh, really lovely to have everyone here. We're going to have a community uh, breakfast with folks uh, right after the show. So looking forward to meeting even more people from this vibrant part of Manitoba. Well, if you are a parent in this province, anywhere in Manitoba, you are likely leaning into a story this morning. As we've been reporting, the interim leader of Manitoba's Progressive Conservative Party says parents should provide informed consent to let their children change their preferred gender pronouns in school. We are getting a number of listener lines on this, and here's what some of you are saying. Hi, my name is Gina. I definitely think parents should be informed because nobody has their child's best interest in mind than a parent. And I think that um, by not informing them, we are not giving the opportunity for families to have these discussions. And um, I think that we have to give them the help they need to have the discussions effectively and affirmatively, but um, they should always have that option because this is their child. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chaz Van Dyke. Yes, uh, most parents, as one of your listeners stated, uh, will treat this in an appropriate way. The issue is that small percentage of parents who are not going to be open to discussion on this. And obviously, if the child is doing this without telling the parents there's a reason for that. It's because it's not safe to do so. Therefore, my strong feeling is that the schools should not be required to report this to parents. After all, that's one of the big reasons why we had a change of government in our last election. Thanks very much. Hi, my name is Christine Lowen, and I'd just like to say we agree with the parents needing to be informed about this and other important topics. During teen years in particular, parents and teens may disagree about very important things and really need to learn how to still show love, kindness, and being able to live together and thrive. It can be a hard work, and, but it is well, well worth the effort. If there is an unsafe place at home, it is all the more important for the school to not keep secrets, but be involved and teach, train, and support Families, stronger families, are in the best interest of all during school and after. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the listener line open to all perspectives anytime on any stories. This morning, uh, you're reacting to a story that's been in the news. The interim leader of Manitoba's Progressive Conservative Party saying parents should provide informed consent to let their children change their preferred gender pronouns in school. We're going to hear more uh, in our news uh, this morning and throughout the day. Time right now is 8.28. And uh, I should mention, I've just invited you to call the listener line. I'll just 
Give you the number, 788-3205. In traffic, just a reminder, that fog is thick. Out here in St. Laurent, it is very, very thick through the windows on the highways. We expect it to dissipate later this morning. So just check if you're traveling anywhere in southern Manitoba if you're heading out. I do want to give some thank yous just ahead of the news here to the folks at MTT Petro Canada here on Highway 6 where we're broadcasting in the diner. Barb and Mike Frutros, thank you so very much. Uh, Communities in Focus is here all week. Thank you so much to everyone who's welcomed us. And big thanks to our CBC team, Emily Brass, Justin Dealey, Nadia Kidwai, Travis Golvey, Blair Melisdravich, Corey Funk, Dylan Longhurst, Brad Lillies, and Abby Adeyemi, everyone involved in the program today, as well as Anneli Gonzalez and Leif Larson, who is uh, back in studio helping out this morning. You heard him taking over for me at the top of the clock. Thank you, Leif. Uh, we are uh, glad to be here and not leaving anytime soon. Communities in Focus is, of course, a project where we come and we just want to stay a while. So all week long, Emily is here listening and learning. If you've got a story to pass along for St. Laurent, we'll uh, get it to her. Radio 893 at cbc.ca. Meantime, back in Winnipeg, uh, beyond that fog, you are expecting a high of three degrees today. So we should see a little bit more melting from those icy conditions this morning. Your CBC Winnipeg News is next. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg at 8.30. It is minus three. We've got some mist out at the airport. And as Marcy said, we're headed to a high today of three. The fog should dissipate by mid-morning. And in the Brandon area right now, zero with some light rain. The person in charge of Manitoba High School sports hopes justice can be found for the victim or victims of an alleged incident of hazing in hockey. RCMP and two school divisions are investigating the Prairie Mountain Mustangs. That's a team that draws players from several rural schools. Chad Falk at the Manitoba High School's Athletic Association doesn't know all the details, but understands investigators are doing their best to uncover the truth. They've told me kind of the steps that they've taken and the steps that they're planning to take and the conversations that they're having and that they're trying to keep open communication with the families Uh, of everyone on the team. Once the allegations came to light from an incident in January, the team withdrew from provincial championships. Its players were made ineligible for their league's postseason awards and all-star game. Manitobans can expect a hike to the minimum wage later this year. The wage will increase 50 cents an hour to $15.80. It starts in October. Labor Minister Malaya Marcelino actually could have permitted another minimum wage increase last year because inflation was high enough, and there is a provision for that in the law. But the government passed on the opportunity. Marcelino says the NDP government had other priorities shortly after taking office. After October 18th, when I was called to cabinet, um, there wasn't really a lot of time to be able to make those types of decisions, to make the calculations and then to go through the requisite consultation period. The wage increase coming in October is based on a legislative formula tying annual increases to inflation. The interim leader of Manitoba's Conservative Party believes parents should be informed if their child wants to change their pronoun. Wayne Wasco wants to ensure parents are involved. If there is significant things happening within the school system, I think parents do deserve to be notified and be let know of of whatever topics they are. Iwasco says the vast majority of the time, school staff can help students communicate with their parents and alleviate fears about how their parents will react. Manitobans from Haiti are worried for the safety of their family in that country. Armed gangs have taken over the capital, Port-au-Prince. Gunmen have burned police stations, government buildings, closed the airport and raided the prison. Haiti's prime minister says he will resign. Marie Pudwell moved from Haiti to Winnipeg in 2008. She says it is unimaginable to see what's happening in Haiti. Every day you wake up, you wake up with, a, with, with, with scared. You wake up with, you don't know if I go on the street today if I'm going to get back home. You don't know if I go on the street today if I'm going to be able to go back home to sleep. And you don't even... Now you're even scared to send your kid to school because they are kidnapping kids even at school. They are kidnapping people at church. Pudwell says one of her family members has been kidnapped and extended family can't afford the ransom. A Winnipeg doctor is suing after she was injured when a parkade elevator near the Health Sciences Centre suddenly dropped while she was inside. 
Chow Pham says she suffers chronic pain and psychological trauma after that incident two years ago. In court documents, Pham claims the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, Shared Health, and the elevator manufacturer neglected to make sure the elevator was safe. Pham had parked on the fourth floor of an Emily Street parkade. She says on the trip down, the elevator suddenly dropped and she fell forward. She says the elevator then stopped, causing serious injuries to her spinal cord and legs. Pham now has permanent disabilities and is suing for lost income and damages. Well, you can once again stream this artist on Spotify. I want to see you dance again because I'm still in love with you. Neil Young demanded his music be pulled off the streaming platform two years ago. He was protesting Spotify's failure to curb misinformation about COVID-19 that aired on the podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience. Young says he decided to bring his music back to Spotify because now Apple and Amazon are also failing to curb misinformation and he can't pull his music off those platforms. Young says he would be limiting streaming options to music lovers. His profile and music are back up on the platform now. Spotify says monthly more than 3 million listeners stream Neil Young's music. When we were and you can find more news updated throughout the day. All you have to do is head to our website cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. And of course, uh, people getting ready for Neil Young to come to Winnipeg this summer. I think he's playing at Shaw Park. I'm going to that show. It is uh, 8.35 a.m. and uh, we're getting ready to wrap our live broadcast from here in St. Laurent this morning. Uh, let's start with uh, Corey Funk, who has a uh, final uh, word on the fog. It's yeah. still out there. Look yeah, at the, out the window. You can't even really even see that there's a highway out there no. uh, out the front of this the, the cast of MTT here. Uh, other than that, though, yeah, high, uh, poor visibility with this fog. Interlake, Winnipeg, Southern Manitoba in general. So look up for that. Freezing rain, western Manitoba around Russell, Minidosa. Might be slippery conditions for you there as well. All right. Thanks, Corey, Thank for you. the reminders and the commute. Uh, so take it easy. And a last word on the uh, weather situation, Abby. We're heading to a high of three degrees today in the city. Some areas in Winnipeg, we're seeing heavy fog. So if you're driving, you need to take it easy. Brandon is seeing freezing and light rain. Thompson is mostly cloudy. Churchill is seeing light snow. Thank you, Abby. And as mentioned, thanks to our entire team and as all the people of this part of Manitoba for welcoming us here in St. Laurent this morning. And we're not done with you yet in this part of Manitoba. Next week, next Thursday, we're live in Ashton at the Chicken Chef. That's going to be our location for our live broadcast as we feature the area of Ericsdale and Ashton. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, bienvenue, and thank you for listening. I'm Marcy Marcusa. Take care, be well, be safe out there in that fog, and we'll be back again tomorrow live with CBC's Information Radio.